Welcome to The Fight with Teddy Atlas, presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the voice of MMA, the great Teddy Atlas. Teddy, what an awesome weekend. We've got a ton of stuff to discuss today. I've been looking forward to this all weekend. Yeah, um, a lot of stuff. I'm looking forward to tomorrow going to Las Vegas for a week for Christmas with my son and my grandson and my daughter-in-law and my wife. We're going to be out there in Vegas. I'm going to have to do next week's episode from Vegas. So... um, we're we're excited about getting out there. I want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas so I don't forget later uh, after the show. But um, I also want to say that I guess the football gods thought you were getting just a little <laughs> bit cocky, maybe, and they uh, they just, you know, I'm not saying that they slammed you, but they just reminded you of always, 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 be humble. And I know you always are. I know you always are, but you're getting a tiny bit too much, they felt, between being the most fashionably <laughs> dressed person at Rob's wedding and, and of course, stating that, the, <laughs> you know, in a very strong way that the Patriots, Patriots were going to the Super Bowl. Matter of fact, I think you even talked about making some reservations um, to be there. <laughs> so it's just a reminder that we are, we are all under... This domain, we we all need to remember that we are all, you know, fallible and um, human, and always be humble. Um, I'm sure the Patriots will bounce back, and um, you know, I'm sure once again you'll be the most fashionably dressed at a, another wedding besides Rob's in the future. <laughs> I'm getting I'm getting old for weddings now. And the next next set of weddings I'll be will be my own kids. But one thing I'll say about the Patriots is if you look back at the years that they've won the Super Bowl, they always seem to have one, had one loss during the season where you're like, "How? What the hell?" If you noticed in that game they gave a block punt return for a touchdown. Mac Jones had two picks. But both of them were unbelievable plays by the defense, especially the second one. I mean, the guy was the defensive play was awesome, but I think that Along the way of uh, to the playoffs, this was probably a good lesson for them and a good reminder of like not to get too far ahead of themselves. And lucky for them, the Titans and the Ravens both lost, so they maintain that second seed in the AFC. And they've only got they've got Buffalo at home, and then they've got Jacksonville and Miami, both of whom are terrible. So theoretically, they should be able to finish off the season strong and be in a good position to get the bye, and that, I think, will be massively helpful to young team. <laughs> you got it all fixed already. <laughs> uh, oh, my God almighty. Oh, boy, oh, boy. <laughs> Can you tell uh, I've been uh, thinking oh about goodness. this? Yes, yes. I hope you thought about this show half as, <laughs> half as much as you thought about that. <laughs> Let me tell you right now. The Miami uh, Dolphins don't sleep course. on them. They're a little bit better, a little bit I better. Agree. I agree. They make me nervous as hell. They already beat the Patriots once. The, the, the Dolphins, they can show up and be like a high school team or they can show up and beat the Packers. I mean, they're, they're so inconsistent, but they clearly have some talented people. Those Packers look good. That that Boy, that it, it reminds oh. you how important it is to have a special quarterback and Rodgers is special. He really is. He's the MVP. He's he's the best quarterback in the league. I don't know how anyone could disagree with it. He's just so consistent and steady. I mean, he never makes really dumb mistakes. He, uh, that guy is awesome. The way he gets rid of that ball from different angles so fast, so fast. Oh, <laughs> it's like yep. a laser. He just lets it go. The crazy thing is when they show a show when they show a uh, zoom in on his face in the mask, you're like. That's the best quarterback. He doesn't look at all. He looks like a like a stoner from a uh, you know like a like a weed movie. He's just kind of like he doesn't look like this superstar athlete like a Deion Sanders. When you see him walk on the field, you're like, this guy's gonna light it up. So I like Aaron and, and he's and he's he's got fast feet. He's fast too. You know what I mean? Uh, you, you realize it when you see him scrambling, not in a fancy, sophisticated way or crazy way like some of the great athletes out there do, but you just realize that. These linemen, these linebackers that are really fast, they're not catching them. <laughs> you realize then how no. how quick he is. Same with the kid who was the same with the kid Hundley who was playing quarterback for the uh, Ravens. As soon as he'd get loose, you'd like, oh my god, an open field. This guy's like gone for 20, 30 yards before you even know what hit what hit you. He's so those guys are so fast. 
Anyway, speaking of fast, uh, we've got an awesome fight to cover from Friday night, and I'm dying to get your thoughts on it. Arter Better Biev stops Marcus Brown in what to me was the definition of two different mentalities. You saw what the what the uh, championship mentality or the champion's mentality of Better Biev that the minute that that he realized how bad he was cut, and we'll get into this, but. The, the ref said, was basically imploring the doctor as the doctor was examining the vicious cut, which you can see behind me, the aftermath on the, um, with, the, with the stitches on Better Biev. The ref said, let, let's give him one more round. We're almost imploring the doctor to let it go one more round. I didn't know, I, I don't know if it was the ref or the doctor. I, no, actually, I think the doctor said one more yeah. round. I actually believe from, from what the commentators um, echoed and from what I think, we heard and what my ears i believe heard was the doctor saying one more round of course it never came to that he didn't stop it but uh he definitely he definitely said that and and as you said it ignited something in better be of you know in his behavior and his mode and his approach from that point on because the fight drastically changed yeah. at that point Better Biev has a tendency, I think, at times to start a little bit slow and feel his opponent out. You noticed him. He was walking Marcus Brown down, but he wasn't throwing. It was almost like he was computing, what, what is Marcus Brown going to do when I walk him into the ropes? But then he'd move, and he'd let him walk around, and he was reserving his shots. The minute they told him that there was one round left, he started opening up and unloading, really picked up the pace and started putting it on Marcus Brown. And, you know, to use one of your phrases uh, when you described the whole, uh, great Evander Holyfield against Mike Tyson, uh, better be was just too much man for Marcus Brown. And once Marcus Brown, Marcus Brown was trying to get him with, I mean, I thought at times being a bit dirty with his head, trying to mash his head into better be in the clinches in a little bit of too aggressive way, I thought. Um, and then when the chips were down and Marcus Brown started to feel the power and get broken down, he submitted and just gave up and quit on his knee. Um, I didn't think he was that hurt. But again, listen, I'm not in there. I don't well, pretend he was, he to, was to hurt. be in He there. was hurt. He got caught in the body. I mean, yeah, I get what get, you're saying, but he, he, did, was getting, he got caught in the body. I completely agree. He was getting broken down left and right. But at the end of the day, he stayed down. He took the full 10 count and just decided he'd had enough. And then... Didn't want to shake hands. Didn't really want to look at better be of after the fight. Just uh, uh, to me, a little bit of a sore sport. It's like, come on, man. Like, you know, better be of is just all business. There, there's nothing to like personally dislike about the guy having been around him before in the Vosdick fight. He just shows up, handles his business. And Marcus Brown wanted nothing to do with him after the fight. He was, I don't know if he was embarrassed or frustrated with himself, but better be of just took him apart bullied him and beat him up all night and forced him to submit. Um, dying to hear your thoughts on this one. How'd you see it? Well, uh, better be of does start a little slow sometimes. And um, first few rounds, he was taking his time to to figure him out and which fighters do. Really good fighters do that. And um, he he was, you know, he's 36 years old. Better be of. He had 300 amateur fights. He was in two Olympics. There's going to start to be, if it hasn't started, some people think it has. Um, there's going to be some give, um, some lessening of his abilities, uh, some, you know, some slippage. It's 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 going to eventually happen if it's not happening already. There were spots there where he didn't pull the trigger quite enough where he kind of let Brown escape a little bit. But um, the first few rounds, he was applying the pressure. Brown was throwing, but better be if was blocking or stepping out of range, uh, you know, for the most part. Brown might have gotten a couple of those rounds uh, just by letting his hands go and maybe, maybe ring, I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to say ring generalship, but um, just control and range. He was trying to fight the right fight. Control range. Keep better be at the outside. Try to keep him off. Try to catch him coming in. You know, try to fire back at the right times. Um, he wasn't really landing. Nobody was doing anything to any kind of, uh, you know, strong point or definitive point. Um, so Brown might have won a round or two there. But then, like we just said, it was like a switch went off. Once better be if there was urgency, better be if knew how to behave like a champion. He knew what he had to do, and he turned it up, and, and he dominated from that point on to the ninth round. Maybe the ninth round, 
uh, you could give, I always want to be fully fair with everything. The ninth round, I think you could give to Brown, um, where he came back a little bit after, after really it was better be of just, like you said, just dominating the fight. Um, but then the ninth, he came back. But then it was over. Because the tenth round better be of started fast instead of ending fast. He started the way he was ending rounds. He started just got it got into him and started letting his hands go and took control, hurt him to the body, dropped him, and you know, uh, like I said, he did it early in the round, not late in the round. That was the difference. I, let me talk about better be if better be if a lot of people call him a caveman. A lot of people well, they call me a caveman too, but a lot of people call better be if. <laughs> A guy who's crude, a guy who's barbaric, a guy who is, um, you know, is, is maybe not sophisticated. I disagree with him. Uh, he's a lot more than that. Uh, he, he's a champion for other reasons than just that he's strong. He, yes, he does have a laser-like attitude and determination, and I think he comes from a part of the world that breeds that a little bit more into a certain kind of, kind of like Khabib uh, the great 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 maybe the greatest of all time uh, UFC fighter champion who retired recently he, he's he got that warrior mentality almost like it's bred like 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 it's a code like a code of honor a code of behavior um, he uh, you know where there's an expectation of how not how you fight but how you behave how you act what you do and, and what you do inside the ring and what you do when the moment comes and that we know that if you want a greater stamina what do you do you do road work you want a better jab what do you do you get a barbell in your hand and you jab with the barbell with the right technique of course or you hit the bag more with the with the jab like Larry Holmes did when he tore his bicep muscle and for nine months uh he couldn't use his right hand so he used his jab for nine months and he had you know, arguably the uh, one of the greatest champs of all time for a heavyweight. Um, he, when those physical traits and attributes can, uh, we know how we develop them. As I just said, you want bigger biceps, you go do curls uh, with the weights. Uh, but what if you want to be more of a stronger mentally? Well, then you practice discipline. You practice doing things that are not easy, that are that are sometimes threatening to you, that that are difficult to do, that that are not comfortable to do. And here's something that I think it's going to perk some people's ears up. Uh, they're going to be surprised to hear it. But you want to form yourself into a warrior. You want to form yourself. I mean, this is the fight game. This is the combat business. You want to form yourself. You're not trying to be an orchestra leader. You're not trying to be, you know, a, a, a guy who's going to be performing, you know, which would be great at Carnegie Hall or, you know, and that's tremendous. But you're, you're trying to get in the pits. You're trying to get in a cage. You're trying to get in a ring in that chamber of truth and have an attitude and a behavior like a warrior, like a gladiator like the ones that we look at and we admire, you know, uh, the samurai. And there's a code attached to that. There's an attitude attached to that. But how do you become that? Well, you become the faster guy, as I said. You do sprints, you do you do sprints with, you want to be faster, you do them with weights on your ankles. Uh, you know, you you. You want your muscles to get bigger. You get into a weight program. Uh, you want your jab. We just talked about all those things, how you physically improve those areas. But mentally, you improve those areas by putting yourself in positions where you face things, where you're more accountable, where outside the ring, you are forming yourself for inside the ring. And here's where it's going to perk people's ears up. I'm going to take you somewhere. Where... Even things like, people are going to think it's crazy, but telling the truth, uh, being just a, uh, I'm not saying you have to be a perfect person, but being a reliable person, being an honest person, being a person that faces things that, that uh, again, is accountable, uh, a, a person 
that doesn't tell lies. Now people are going to say, Teddy, you don't got to be a, a monk. You don't got to be a priest, you know, uh, to be a fighter. And, and that's been proven. Yeah, yeah. What I'm saying is to form, sometimes some fighters have had so much talent that their talent protects them in areas where they're weak. Cuss used to have a saying, he used to say, Teddy, remember this. It always go when the abilities are comparable or close. The man with the stronger will, constitution, makeup, will always win. Not sometimes, but always, when the talents are close. The only difference when will does not beat skill is when, when one man's skill is so, so far superior that the other man's will never gets tested. That is so damn true. People should live by that and understand that. I'm, I'm just telling you, that is so true. I mean, the easy example, take a high school, you know, a tremendous high school basketball player, all right? Tremendous, tough as nails. Uh, or let's even go lower, grammar school player. Tough as nails. He's, he wants to be the next Kobe Bryant, the next Michael Jordan. And he's tough. He's everything. And, uh, you know, and, and, he's, and he's great talent. But then you put him in with LeBron James. Well, you shouldn't be doing that. I get it. The skill level is so far superior that no matter how tough that kid is, even if he's in high school, he ain't winning. Well, it's the same thing here. And what happens is guys like Better Beef, they prepare themselves from a certain age to be what they say they want to be, to be a warrior. And to be a warrior, to be a titan, to be a samurai, you know, to be a gladiator, to be a world champion, to be the toughest fighter you can be, a guy that finds a way, you have to feel like that person. And the point I'm making is guys like Better Beef, they go about, and there's many of them, they go about their business in life. Holyfield was like that. He made mistakes in life. But where he didn't make mistakes was facing things, being accountable, not making excuses. That's important too. Not making excuses. So we understand how we figure out the physical domain of improving ourselves. We understand that. There's exercises, there's drills, you know, there's, there's even nutritional systems that help us. But what helps us become more of a man, more of a warrior, more of a gladiator? What helps us become more dependable? and reliable in those areas. What I'm talking about. Because when the moment comes, when the moment comes that your skill's not enough, and it comes down now to other things we're talking about, your will, you have to believe. You have to believe that that's you, that that's there. That's the trick, that word. Circle that word, you young fighters. Believe. Believe. It's not just talking about believing. It's doing. It's the way you live. It's what you've done. You have to believe. So when that moment comes that you have to believe that you are a warrior, that you have to believe that you're a titan, you have to believe that you are somebody who can find a way. You have to feel like that person. You can't feel like a person that lies, that gets shortcuts, that makes excuses. You can't feel like that person. You So when a guy like Better Beef lives his life, he means it with a certain cold. It's inside and outside. It's not just in the ring. It's, it's outside for the inside of the ring, for the inside of him. You know, people talk about, oh, you have to have core strength, Teddy. Yeah, I get it. I get it. You go in the gym, you, you get the right guy to work with you, you get core strength. What is core strength? What is real core strength? What I'm talking about. Where do you get that? Where do you get that? You get that by living. You get that by your action. Not your words, but your action. And when you're tested for that action, where you don't make it true, where you, where you live a certain kind of life. And again, a lot of people, when I talk to young kids, and people ask me to talk to young kids, and football teams, NFL teams, and I talk about a morality about having a certain morality, a, a certain connection to the way you live, to who you are, to, to what you think the proper contact outside. Now, most people think it's about going out and not drinking and not part. Yeah, it's about that. It's about that. But 
it's also because that's the physical part of it that can hurt you and we understand that that can hurt you but it's also about the conduct with that you're betraying your word you're de- betraying your commitment when you go out say you go out and the alcohol didn't hurt you but you're betraying you're lying you're saying that you want to be a champion but you're not behaving like a champion you go out and you get into a situation where whatever whatever it is and instead of facing it you make up lies and and you 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 uh you find a way out of it well that's not strong you're supposed to be doing things that are strong right? That's not strong. Now, a simple thing like that kind of behavior. Now you get in the ring. Now your talent's not enough. Now it's even. Now it's about who's tougher, if you want to just use that simple word. And now you got to grab onto something. So you grab onto what you really believe, who you are. And when you grab onto it, what do you find? A person who lied? A person who broke his word? A person who made excuses? A person who didn't behave the way we think of a warrior, a titan, a samurai, a champion, behaving. Is that what you wind up having? You're looking for something strong and you find something weak. That never happens with a guy like Better Beef. Never. Never. And I'm just saying, I'm, I'm saying it from my experience, from my mind, from my heart. To, to all the young aspiring fighters out there and aspiring young everything. Don't have to be a fighter. You could be a guy that wants to be the best teacher. You want to be the best, you want to be the best lawyer, the best doctor. You want to be the best plumber. You want to be the best carpenter. I'm, I'm talking, I'm, you want to be the best person, the best human being you can be. You want to be strong. When the moment comes to be strong, you want to find something that can make you feel strong, not something that makes you feel weak. That's what I'm talking about. And that's Better Beef. And Better Beef deserves that. I just took 20 minutes to talk about that. He deserves it. He deserves it, damn it. And I just wanted to say that. And the other part, breaking down the analytics of the fight, he's not a caveman. He's a guy that, He's never going to be the fastest. He's a good, solid puncher, but he's never going to be, you know, he, he's never going to be uh, uh, the puncher that wider is for one punch, you know, or or like a George Foreman was. Or but but he's a real good, solid puncher. But he's he's solid enough technically. There's not one area you say he's really bad. He he's solid in all areas enough. But you know what he is. He judges distance well. He stepped out of range with the longer-armed Brown, you know, and maybe the faster Brown. He knew when to step out of range and not let Brown beat him to the punch. Then he stepped back in range. He reached in a few times, but he didn't pay a price. Brown missed an opportunity to counter there, maybe, maybe. But he he's very good at judging distance. He's very good at being calm and being controlled. Yeah, I'll say it again, calm and controlled. That's important. He's very good at being consistent. That's important. And he knows when to throw and when not to throw. And when he does get inside, he picks his spots pretty damn good. Pretty damn good. And he puts punches together really short. You know, I love Joe Lewis, one of the greatest short punches of all time. You look at some film of the great Joe Lewis. I'm not trying to say better be if he's in the company of Joe Lewis, but you look at some film of Joe Lewis who throws nice short punches, six-inch punches, Ken, and then you look at better be if. Oh, my goodness. He throws six-inch punches. He throws little punches that look like they're not doing nothing. They're doing a lot. He's a, he's a short puncher. He puts them together. He Again, he knows when to throw what. And I'll tell you the other thing, where he is sophisticated, very sophisticated, but he does it in such a subtle way, just in such a steady way, you know, you don't, you miss it. But when he got inside with Brown and he was looking for the right spots and Brown was covered up and the right spots weren't there, what did he do? He made a little step to the side, a little twist to the side where all of a sudden it opened up a different angle. It opened up a different opportunity for a clean punch. And he landed them. And he landed them. And and boy, he's a good finisher. 
when he gets hurt on you, I mean, you, that old saying, you know, he's all over you like a cheap suit. I mean, you 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 know how those cheap suits that well, you wouldn't know you you wear Armani, but when when you put on one of those cheap suits, I've had a couple on uh, when I was a kid, and and you and it's too a little too small for you. You can't get it off. You can't get you can't get this man off you. You can't get this man off you, and he again. Those are all the bricks. Those are all the bricks to the building that is called Arthur Better BF. To the championship building that's called Arthur Better BF. All the things I just described, and and he steps to you. He you know uh, he steps to you. He his pressure is relentless. He cuts the ring down pretty good. But those are the bricks that make this building. But here's the cement. Everything I spent the first twenty minutes talking about. That's the cement. And if you want one word for it, yeah, it takes a lifetime to develop it. But if you want one word for it, character. His character. And just for the young fighters, the young athletes, again, the young everyone out there, I want us all to be better. I want to get better. Every day I try to get better. Remember that. That the greatest power you have is the power inside you. The power to make a choice. And you have to prepare yourself to make those right choices by living the right way and doing the right things and facing the things you got to face. And better be of his to make those choices. So when the moment comes, he has no doubt. He has no doubt. So my hat's off to the guy. He beat my guy. He beat my guy. I know what I'm talking about. With this, and he be my, and I, I salute him. I salute him. We had the right. We, we knew how to fight him. We were winning that fight going into the tenth round. Into the tenth round, we were ahead on two of the three scorecards on the with the judges. I mean, that's a fact. But he knew how to break us down, and he broke us down. He broke us down. He broke us physically down and mentally down. He broke us down. I take responsibility for that. By the way, I do. I do. But that doesn't mean that I can't face it and be honest about it and explain it in a way that he deserves it to be explained. And young fighters out there should hear that. So that that's that fight. Now, what I like to make uh, a prediction about, this is our prediction corner. Prediction <laughs> corner. We're going to have a new thing on this show. Prediction corner. Um... I'm going to, I don't know if it's going to shake the mountaintops, but I'm going to make a prediction that something's going to happen now because of this fight where Canelo's people who are very smart, very smart. They're like Mayweather's people, very smart at picking their spots, very smart. Canelo people are going to do the same thing they did a few years ago when people wanted him to fight Triple G and he wasn't ready to fight him yet. And he knew it. And his people knew it. So they waited. They waited. And then all of a sudden, one day they surprised people. They said, okay, we're ready. You know why? Because they had watched Triple G with Daniel Jacobs. And it looked like there was some slippage. It looked like there was a little slippage. And they said, there it is. It's the time to pounce. It's the time to make this fight. And they made it. And I didn't think they won. I didn't think they won either one of them, to be honest. Definitely didn't think they won the first one, which was a draw. But but they picked the right spot, the right time. And and they were able to, well, it, it created a new part of their legacy, a new part of their life, a new part of their career that took them to another place, another, yeah, another stratosphere. And I think that Canelo's people saw the same thing, or at least they think they did against Brown, that the great gunslinger, it's like the great gunslingers, where all of a sudden they're a little slow on the on the draw, where there were spots there, I mentioned it early, where it better be if it just looked like he didn't pull the trigger. But then he did later. But it just looked like he didn't pull the trigger early on. Maybe we saw it, maybe we didn't really see it. I don't know. He's 36 years old. And it's going to happen sooner or later where that gunsling is a little slow on the draw and then Billy the Kid comes into town and, well, you know the rest. So I, I'm i going to make a prediction that you're going to hear shortly 
in the next maybe weeks, maybe the next months, you're going to hear that Canelo's people are going to call out Better Beef. That they're going to they they're going to need time to build that. It's going to be a huge fight, but that they're going to I I just really feel that don't be shocked if you hear that. For the reasons I just said that now they think and I just hope they don't wait the way they waited and my fans the not my fans our fans the fans the fans the fans um they're going to I think they're going to agree with what I'm about to say don't wait as long as the Mayweather and Pacquiao waited for that fight don't wait they they waited too long they waited too long for that one don't wait too long for this one and um I don't think they waited too long for Triple G and Canelo, the first one. It was a great fight. I don't think they, uh, they, they waited too long, maybe a little bit. They, they waited the right amount of time when they were the ones that were in the driver's seat where they're the golden goose in boxing. They bring the, the, the money. They bring the fans, the numbers, pay-per-view to a certain extent. And... um. So they knew they had that power to make the guy wait a little, and they have that power again. They're the they're the ones with the the that bring the money. They're the golden goose, but I just hope they don't wait too long. But that would be the fight that I think you know everybody's talking about seeing Spence and Crawford. Uh, we're not going to see it yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Um, instead, you're going to see uh, Spence and Ugas, um, but. I think people would love to see this fight, Canelo and Better Be If. And if they don't wait too long, and I I think it's coming now. I think it's coming. I think we might get it. What do you think, Ken? Yeah, no, I think they're definitely going to do that. That'll give them three of the light heavyweight belts. If they can entice Bivol in the next year or two, they could basically uh, unify that um, weight division like they did with super middleweight. So, yeah, I think that that's the most likely uh, scenario after they take a cruiserweight title. Yeah, I, I tell you, um, I don't know what's making me say this right now. It's things jump into my head, so I just shoot them out there, you know. But uh, all I want for Christmas, um, I have my two front teeth. I want Al Heyman to be my promoter <laughs> because he he you could lose you could be there. Look at Adrian Broner. You could lose. You could you could. <laughs> That's uh, crazy, uh, 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 right? I mean, and and he always gets your fight, and he always makes you more money than than you than you probably would think that you were entitled to off of what you know off of what you've done. Um, I mean, I, I just thought of that. I ju- it just popped into my head. You know, there's there's four power brokers out there, three or four, right? The main guys. You know, you got Aram, you got Eddie Hearn, you got Al Heyman. You know, De La Hoya is hanging on by his string. I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 what can I say about the guy? I don't know. He, I mean, the good news is we haven't heard anything about him recently. Yeah. That that in a way, God bless him. That that's that's the good news. And I don't be I'm serious. Um. You know, it reminds me of the, remember that movie? I'm always throwing a movie. But remember the movie with Jerry Maguire where where I love, what was it? The Q, Cubist Jr. Where where he's playing the, uh, the football player. And then, of course, uh, Jerry Maguire is Tom Cruise. And where Cubist says, you're hanging on by a string. I love it. I love it. <laughs> you're hanging on there, Jerry. Jerry, you're hanging on by a string, Jerry. Jerry, <laughs> you're, 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 you're barely hanging on. But I love it. And he starts throwing punch. But, um, uh, you know, Oscar's hanging on there by a string. But uh, those those are the power brokers. And boy, oh boy, if if that if that um if that Heyman again, uh, all I want for Christmas is Al Heyman to be my promoter because that my agent, whatever, because he he gets his fighters no matter what happens, no matter how much they lose. He, he gets them second, third, fourth, fifth. He gets them all these chances. He makes them more money than than you would ever imagine in the situations they're coming from, sometimes off losses and stuff. Uh, he, he really does. Now, listen, a lot of people don't like him because he controls the, with the PBC and, of course, with Showtime and with, with Fox. He, he, he just plays the, well, he plays musical chairs with his fighters, you know, and he's doing that again with Ugas, 
he's doing that again with with Ugas and 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 uh, and Spence. But they all do. You know, he keeps it in house. They all they all do that. You know, until there's a big enough fight where they have to go out of house. They're forced to. <laughs> but um. S- Speaking of the power brokers, you mentioned Eddie Hearn, and um, I saw on the internet Eddie Hearn responded to you after. We're going to talk about the Parker Chisora fight. What an awesome he, heavyweight he, he fight. He responded that was. to what? I didn't and even know. Eddie Hearn, you sent out a tweet that said, um, give these men both a fight of the night bonus, like a UFC style. And Eddie Hearn said, oh, uh, so one of the reporters read it to Eddie Hearn. He said, what did he say? He said, yeah, they said you should give, Teddy say you should give them both the bonus. He said, oh, that's very nice of Teddy. If he could just send me the money. I'd be happy to give it to them. I'd be glad uh, to send it to you, Eddie. I'll send you half. You come up with the other half. <laughs> I think they deserve it uh, that much. Uh, listen, Eddie is the man over there. He's the man in Europe. Uh, you know, he might be coming the man over here too. But yeah. um, he, he's the man over there. He definitely is. He's the youngest of all the guys. Um, he's in a great position, you know. And listen, give him. I give him the credit. But I also give the fighters the credit. And uh, those fighters, they deserve the credit. We'll talk about it more later. But that's just all a Parker. When you see that, they deserve a bonus. And and Eddie Hearn is not the only guy I'm pointing that at. I pointed at Aram. I pointed at all of them, you know. And, and I'm sure and I'm sure Eddie Hearn's not the only one who has that uh, answer. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm sure all the other ones would say, that's very nice of Teddy. Teddy, give it to him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. I usually don't say things that I'm not prepared to do. I really mean that and I, I'm never going to say I would do it until I'm in position to be tested in that way because that's when you find out about people not what they say but what they do when the moment comes but um, if I was a promoter and I'm not counting Eddie Hearn's money but I think he's doing okay if if I was a promoter and I, I'm, I'm telling you Ken I can't stand behind this uh, and I was the promoter and they were fighting on my shows, and obviously I'm making they're making money with me, and um, there's no charity here, and I'm making money with them. I would give them a bonus. That's all I'm saying. I'm not knocking Eddie Hearn. I'm, I'm just saying, but I would give him a. I would. I, I would. And again, that would have to be tested, Teddy. Yeah, I get you. I hear you. You guys in your underwear over out there in the <laughs> down in, in the place. I hope the heat's on down in those cold basements. But <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I. I would have to be tested, and I would hope that I'd live to my word. And you know what? Living to my word is important. Um, yeah, I would. Uh, yeah. Well, Teddy, I, I if, 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 do you have anything else on Better Be of and Brown? Because if not, let's jump right into that Chisora Parker fight. No, no. I mean, unless you have something else, that's. Let's get into pa- Parker Chisora. Unbelievable, unbelievably entertaining heavyweight fight. It's why the heavyweights get paid what they do. Big guys throwing big shots. Joseph Parker seemed to be outclassing him all night. But Chisora is a, I mean, can you be, t- I don't know that you can be tougher than Chisora. He took shot after shot. I think he got knocked down three times and he kept coming. And um, Joseph Parker three got times in three, three times in three different rounds. Yep. Keep, keep that keep that in your mind. Put a note <laughs> know, on that because we're going to come going. back to that. We're going to yeah. come back to that. I'm going to let you finish. But three, yeah. that's three 10-8 rounds, three, okay? 10, rounds. Do the do the math, you beautiful people across the pond. That's all. <laughs> Your math is the same, <laughs> right? It is the same across the pond, right? Right? <laughs> yep. Right? Eight is eight. Ten is ten. Two and two is four. Okay, that's all I'm saying. Go ahead, go on. Go on, I'm sorry. And Parker Parker took some big shots and just kept putting it on Derek all night. And to your point, this was, oh my God, they had it set up perfectly to rob Parker. There was no way Parker was winning that fight if it went to the scorecards. Unless, of course, he knocks him down so many times that they couldn't rob him. And thank God for Parker, thank God. No, it went to the scorecards. Kind of did go to the scorecards. I, I know, but my point is the only way Parker wins this is if he knocks him down multiple times in multiple rounds and even oh, then, oh, yeah, even yeah, yeah, then he barely squeaks out of there with the win. Well, two points. Two points on one judge. I mean, come on. Talk Again, about- do the math over there. You beautiful <laughs> people. I love you. But the math, it's the same math system, right? Unless Listen. they change it. And I don't know. 
the fact that the right man got the decision is going to allow these judges to have this decision swept their scorecard swept under the rug but we shouldn't not allow here it. not shouldn't here allow it to be swept under the rug we should assume that they robbed this guy of his win he beat the crap out of Derek, and 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 still these judges wanted to give that they did everything they could everything they could like i i just don't we know how shine they a light we shine a a, a broad large light on everything on everyone and if you're hiding somewhere in a corner we 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 get the light with more of a finer you know sort of tube to get into that corner and we're going to shine a light that's that's what we feel we are part of our job is to do shine a light on the areas that need a light shine and try to bring the truth out in this business in all aspects all areas and no matter what and that's that was terrible what Ken's I'm, talking about. If I'm Joseph Parker, I don't fight with that, with whoever put that fight together, the promotion, the organization, the the the, um, the governing bodies. I don't fight for them anymore. Dude, Joseph Parker, they wanted to rob you. They did everything they could to steal that fight from you. And I love Derek Chisora. I think Derek Chisora, will, Derek Chisora probably heard the cards and was like, what in the hell? What fight are they watching? Classy These guys man. Chisora, Chisora is everything you want in a, a warrior. He's a classy man, too. That being said, if you're going to rob a bank, these judges are the people to do it with. They don't give a crap about what the, the perception of the public has of them. They'll do anything they can to get help you rob that bank. So if you're going to rob a bank, call those judges. They're the guys. They're, 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 they're your partners in crime. They have no integrity. That that Those scorecards were laughable. I mean, wh how can you even look was one in the, the names? Was one of the names of the judges Dillinger? <laughs> Charles Manson. <laughs> was Dellinger one of them? The Unabomber was one of them. Charles Manson. I mean, come on, guys. Like, have some integrity. Be dependable. Have some, like, have some pride. Be able to go home and be like, yeah, look, I know, I know they wanted us to give it to Chisora, but Joseph beat the crap out of him, so I judged it honestly. Not, I did my best to rob him for you guys, but sorry, you just put it on him too bad. Anyway, how'd you like the fight in general before we keep ripping the judges apart? Uh, look, it was a rematch from seven months ago. Seven months ago, Chisora fought a split decision with him. Um, this time, it was, you know, as much as they tried to make it a split decision, it wasn't close. It was a fight that could have been stopped in some spots. You could argue that it was close. Well, not even argue. You could see it was close to being stopped in a few spots, where Chisora just walked away almost almost you started to wonder is he out of it like is he you know is is he uh you know is he is he semi-conscious uh the way he was walking but he was just walking get distance and then he got himself together and he did what he does which is go to war no wonder that his fight name is war because that's what this guy does he's a war horse he's a war horse but uh He's a he's a war horse who's thirty seven years old now, and he's been doing this a long time. <laughs> this is what he does. He does war, you know. He doesn't do treaties. He doesn't uh, do amnesty. He doesn't do uh, surrenders. He does war. He does war, and there's a price to pay when you do war. And it comes to a time when you know you have to be retired from war i think he should be retired after this fight and given a bonus or given something but in all seriousness you got to be careful because this guy should have a parade for him i know he never won a title he never beat the guys at the next level i i put it all out there the good the bad the in between not the bad the honest <laughs> there's nothing bad about a guy like Shusor. He's never won at the next level. He's been very competitive there, but he's never won at the next level. But he's fought everybody, titles, everything. And he's always given everything. He's the guy I talk about when I fight for the fighters and for the sport. And where I got in trouble on ESPN over 25 years for saying things. Where I would go out there and say things about the sport, the corruption part of it, and try to fix it. And I would get angry. Because I would get angry because of men like Shusora, where they go in the ring and they come out of it with less of themselves. That's Shusora. Not less of his dignity. That's always going to be intact. Not less of his resolve. That's what he is. That's what he's practiced his whole life, to have resolve, to behave like a man. But less physically. And it catches up to you. I mean, he's a guy that 
I hope to God the commissions are aware. I hope to God his corner people and they get together and they, they think about retirement now. He's had a great career. He's given you beautiful fans. I joke with you. I love you over the course of pond. He's given you everything and more you could ask for. He's given you thrills. He's given you victories. And in defeat, he's given you every ounce of himself where you never really thought he lost in some cases because he gave so much of himself. He he deserves a parade. He deserves to be applauded for being one of the true great warriors from anywhere, but definitely to represent the United Kingdom. He he um he's at the end of the road where somebody's gotta look out for a warrior like this and say, Okay, it's time to walk off to the sunset with your head held high with applause. And with thank yous, thank you for what you've given us, all those thrills and all those moments. And I'll tell you one other thing I talk about all the time, those lessons of how to behave like a man, those lessons of never to give up, those lessons of how, no matter how dismal it looks, no matter how terrible it looks, no matter how hopeless it looks, to always try to find a way, to never give up, to never give in, to never make excuses. That's you. You've taught us that. And if you didn't teach us that, for the ones that were getting a little tired and you know a little winded, you reminded us that it's always our choice, no matter how difficult things are. It's always our choice of how we we'll behave. What we'll do when the moment comes. And you always made the right choice. You always made the right choice, Mr. Chrysora. Mr. Chrysora. You always made the right choice. Always. You always behave the way we wish and hope that you would behave. And maybe the way we wish we could behave when we're in those situations. Boy, you are tremendous. And then you go into the locker room, just like you did after the Usyk fight, and just which was very, very competitive too. And just like you then you tested Usyk. And you might have been the reason why Usyk beat Joshua for the heavyweight title. You got him ready. You got him ready for what he needed to be ready for. And you went into his locker room after the fight, and you went in to Parker's locker room with food. (laughs) <laughs> you just had a war with him and you brought food and you went in there and you ate like two gentlemen like two warriors that respect each other that appreciate what they just went through what they just shared in that ring what they just risked in that ring you are a tough man and you are a classy man and you're a good man and I just I wish you nothing but luck in whatever you do. I hope that you do retire because I think with all that punishment, all those punches you've taken, I always say you don't judge a fight chronologically that he's 37. You judge him by how long he's been fighting, how many punches he's been taking for that length of time. And because of that, you have to give you what you've given us. The appreciation, the respect, the consideration, the care to think about what's best for you. You've given us you've given us care about how you fought, how you behaved, you know, all of that. You've given us everything. We need to the people around you, the commissions who make a decision when you can fight next. They all need to think about that. And give you what you've given us. Just the care, the appreciation for what should be next for you. And I, I'll tell you, Parker was the best I've ever seen him. I've never seen him this aggressive, but this smart at the same time. Usually he uses his side. He's a big, strong man, and he's a tough man, and he's a strong man. I'll say it again. And he usually stays on the outside, uses his jab, and kind of plays it safe and plays it careful and, you know, moves a little bit, uses his legs, 
and and stays outside looking for the one two and you know he fights that way but this time he fought the way I think he was always supposed to fight and maybe it's got something to do with his trainer I don't know how long the trainer's been with him Andy Lee who used was a former champion uh, I believe a junior middleweight uh, it was either junior middleweight, middleweight, or super middleweight. I'm not sure, but from Ireland, he was an Olympian. I I actually caught his fights for NBC in the Olympics when he when he represented Ireland, and uh, I caught some of his fights on ESPN in the pros. But he's a trainer now, and I think he's doing a good job. And it looked like he did a good job for Parker. I got to tell you because. Again, it's the best I ever saw Parker, mentally and physically, technically. He didn't run, he didn't move, just move to survive and, you know, just just win that way. Um, he didn't just stay on the outside and play it safe. But he, but he played it smart, though. But he played it right. I thought for fights like this with a style of Trezor, he should grab the floor. He should grab the floor, keep range, keep dictate control range be able to keep the guy at the end of his punches and make him pay it for a price like i always said on espn make him pay a price for the real estate you want you want three feet of real estate it's going to cost you four punches and that's what he did he 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 kept him outside by setting his feet by keeping him at the end of his punches Knowing that range, knowing where that was, he made Chisora have to travel. We know Chisora has to get close. He's shorter armed. He's a shorter guy. He he bends for. He comes in like a Joe Frazier to a certain extent. You know he has to get close to be at his best. And Parker understood that. He had a game plan for that. But this time, he did it by grabbing the floor, Controlling range, but being set to punch. And making him pay for a price to get close. Making him go through a bad neighborhood to get to him. And mugging him on the way to get through that bad neighborhood. And he chose the right punches. The uppercut, because he understood Shazor would bend forward. He could catch him uppercut, and he did. He hurt him with uppercuts. And also straight right hands on the outside. Where he, he caught right hands were important for Parker, straight right hands on the outside, and they were important for Chisora. The only difference is Chisora throws the round ones, the looping ones. But he did a great job, great fight plan, great strategy, but great preparation. He was ready to grab the floor, Parker, and be set to punch, not just move away, but punch and then keep that distance move back you know move back another four inches and set up again the guy comes in uh Chisora comes in three inches you move back six but you set the punch and you catch him and you use those extra inches to your advantage and he did that and he did it beautifully and then he went and fought I always talk about geography whoever owns the geography that best suits their talents and their abilities is going to be winning the fight uh, for the most part. And then what did he do? He went into the geography, Parker did, of Chisora on the inside, and he handled that well. Because his punches were a little bo bit more uh, cleaner, sharper, less fat on him, uh, you know, more definitive. Just he, he was able to land with the uppercut inside, short punches inside. Uh, he was able to hold his own, if not get the better on the inside, which is Chisora's area. That's Chisora's territory. So, again, the best i ever seen him. That's the park I want to see. Yeah, using that big, big, bone, strong, you know, uh, physique and abilities that he was given and that his genetics gave him. He, he used them a lot better than he did in the past when I saw him doing a poor man's imitation of Ali. And that's an exaggeration. He was never Ali trying to move around like that. But you get the idea. You get what I'm trying to say. And um, he was terrific. But again, I come back to Chisora. You were terrific, as you always are, in your behavior. In your behavior. And again, the lessons that you teach us, no matter how tough things get, it's your choice how you behave. It's your choice what you do. 
And boy, oh boy, you did what you've always done, Mr. Trezora. You fought like a champion. You fought like you behaved like a champion, like a warrior. And you might never have won that title, that world title. As I said earlier, you came up short, just a little short sometimes. But you never came up short in the most important area of behavior, of behaving like a champion, behaving like a warrior, behaving like a man. Well, perfect summation, Teddy. Um, Joseph Parker. And those keep- judges, shame on you, judges. One judge I had can't a 14, let that go. One judge had a 14-12. He gave when I up. heard that score, you know what I said? <laughs> I said, holy crumpets. <laughs> one judge holy a, crumpets. One judge gave Chisora six rounds and only scored two of the ten knocked, two of the three knockdown rounds. I want to make one suggestion for those judges. Really, really. I'm always trying to make boxing better. So are you. We're always trying to help. Get them CAT scans. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe some way vicariously, uh, osmosis, maybe some way they're, they're too close to the ring. And, you know, sometimes they say if you're too close to a microwave oven, you're taking some of those rays. They could be damaging. I don't know. Maybe you're too close to the ring and you're taking some of those punches in a way that we haven't understood yet. We haven't gotten the science to understand yet. And and you need a CAT scan to see if you're being damaged. If you're being damaged in that sort of way, get CAT scan for these judges. One of the okay? judges. One of the judges scored one of the knockdown rounds. And Eddie Hearn. Eddie Hearn. Listen, Eddie. I'll pay for the CAT scans. I'll pay for that. The CAT scans. I can. I can handle, Eddie. I'm not quite in your league with, uh, you know, with your bank account, but I. I can handle the. I handle the cat scans. One of the judges gave uh, one of the knockdown rounds 10-9 for Parker. And for the record, all three knockdowns were like legit knocked on your ass knockdowns. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, that's only a 10-9. I didn't see Chisora win any one-sided rounds. And then he got knocked down. And okay, maybe you could say 10-9 since Chisora put it on him and then just got a flash knockdown. Parker knocked him on his ass every single one of those knockdowns. But Teddy, if you're looking for a last-minute Christmas gift, you know what's a good one? A subscription to your favorite supplement, Athletic Greens. We've been talking about these guys for a long time. They spent 10 years with top doctors and nutritionists to create this formula. Well, they've helped you a lot. Ken, Hell they've helped yes. kidding aside. Yes. You've, you've put it to, you've really put it to the test. I That's mean, right. you don't just talk about it. You use the product and obviously it's, you feel it's helped you with those marathons. so Definitely. It's a gift that I'd love to receive for Christmas. Give someone the subscription of health. Consider it an insurance policy for your body's health and immunity. It's literally all you need to stay on top of your immunity, especially in the time of COVID and Omicron and Delta. Get an extra level of protection. I'm not suggesting Athletic Greens will prevent you from getting COVID, but it certainly won't hurt you. And... Um, whether you're looking to boost your energy level, support your immune system, or address address gut health, Athletic Greens is the way to go. Simply visit athleticgreens.com slash atlas to get your special offer of 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. Again, athleticgreens.com slash atlas to get the free offer. And just to reiterate, the stuff tastes great too. It's like, the, this isn't like choking down cough syrup. This is like a good tasting green drink. Again, do yourself a you favor. You know, just shook his head. I, I got to tell you something, Ken. You do a great job with those. I'm going to add to it. We take, hey, look, like anybody, I'm sure, I would hope. But you take pride in what you endorse. Uh, you don't just, I don't think we'd be endorsing things that aren't good for you or we didn't believe in or, you know, we didn't have some kind of uh, idea by using it, by, by seeing the results of it. Um, we wouldn't. Uh, you got to trust us on that, but I think hopefully you do understand that. And um, as you were saying that, our man Sam Rivera, who is with us and does the filming here, because I'm not capable of filming myself. I'm not as uh, adept at such um, things and such technological things as you are. I didn't go to college like you did, and um, everything else. And have I, to I barely just, went. No, but you went, you went, you went, and you and you you did great, and um, but Sam Rivera is great at what he does with the filming here, and he's uh, been with us a long time, and he's a fitness freak like you. He, I mean, he is, and um, he's lost over his 
um, last couple of years. I'm going to ask him if I'm incorrect about this because he's, he's in front of me. But uh, he's lost over 100 pounds. How, how much weight have you lost? 100 pounds. 100 pounds. So I, I got it right. And he's, you know, he's committed to fitness. And when you started talking about it tastes good and it this and that, he's, I see him shaking his head. Yes, because he's been taking it. And this is a guy who's as strict as you get with diet and with training. I mean, you lose 100 pounds, you got to be pretty strict at the way you're living, at the, what you're putting in your body. I mean, you don't need Teddy Atlas to tell you that. Um, you don't need, you know, a nutritionist to tell you that. The results speak for themselves. And he is using Athletic Greens. And he, uh, well, you tell me. Go ahead. What do you think? No, I, I like it. I agree with Ken. It, it tastes great. Um, I was taking some other, you know, green green drink supplement, and it tasted like garbage. And uh, I switched over to Athletic Greens, and it's made it made a huge difference. It's great. There it is. Uh, I don't think you get a more honest, better endorsement than than that than people that are living it, doing it, drinking it, um, and showing the, you know, showing the effects of it. Um, the effects with you, you live your life that way, you're running marathons, uh, obviously it's helping you, Ken, it's definitely not hurting you, and obviously here's a man who lost 100 pounds and uh, he believes in this, uh, obviously he, uh, his judgment actually uh, means something uh, in, in the case that we're talking about or the areas that we're talking about, so there it is, uh, go, go get them, go get them for Christmas. <laughs> Well, let's talk UFC now. You are the voice of the of the MMA world. Everyone's dying to hear your thoughts. This was a quick one, but we're just going to touch on the main event from the UFC fight night on Saturday night. Derek Lewis does what Derek Lewis does. Smashes. Oh, my God. I'm spacing on the guy's name. The cop from Philly. Um, Chris oh, Dukakis. 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 Chris For, Dukakis. Former police officer before the fight. Derek Lewis, one of the most entertaining entertaining guys in the sport. He said, I don't want to, uh, you know, getting in there with the police officer. I don't want to have a Rodney King on my hands. I don't want to be uh, have people see a cop beating me up in there. So I'm going to try and get him out of there. And he did just that. He did exactly what you would expect. Comes forward catches him a shot, and then just annihilates him and uh, blasts Cock Dawkus right out of the ring, um, knocks him out cold um, in Derek Lewis fashion. How'd you like that fight? Listen, first of all, Lewis is a smart guy. We, he, forget about his power. The guy's got a great personality. That guy, the, the guy can be a superstar because this guy has a funny personality. He's, he's not stupid. He's smart. He says things. <laughs> he he's got a following already. It it could get even bigger. My God, if he ever won a title. Uh, he's He is a bit like a caveman in some ways where I said that uh, better be if it's not. Uh, and, and I admit that I am. So me and Lewis could hang out with two cavemen. But he he is crude in his approach and in his technique. But I'll tell you what else he is. He is explosive as hell. Damn, he's explosive. And he's athletic. He he don't have the body that Nganyu has, who's a big monster too, and powerful, powerful man. Um, but he is, for a big man and a powerful man, and he is one of those guys I talk about, punches or not, made they are born he's born with power in the right hand he's the ernie shavers of the ufc with right hands that can knock walls down but i didn't realize how explosive he is uh, how quick he could get in on you you see how quick he closed the gap and bam! i mean that's that's athleticism that's not just the fist that's the legs that's the overall package that's the overall genetics of this guy and he and he knows how to finish. I mean, he's got great instincts. He's got instincts for a guy who's crude, and that's fair, who's crude in a lot of his approach, a lot of his technique. His instincts are so freaking good that he's got instincts. You think of a guy that's crude, you think only go forward, only throw monster shots, 
you know, from all over, left field, right field, center field, and all that kind. That's what you think of. But no, this guy, I'm watching him, and he had the instinct to all of a sudden throw a right-hand counter. I was like, whoa, whoa. Like the guy came forward, boom, he throws a right-hand counter. He waited for it, and his instincts told him to. That is not crude. That is not primitive. That's advanced. And he's got the capability. He's got the capacities for those things. It's got to be developed more and brought out more, like in Ganyu. And Ganyu was very similar to him. And he lost to Stipe, the uh, Mahovich, the first time. I, I, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing uh, the names exactly right. Um, I've never pretend to be Orson Welles. This is not the Orson Welles show. It, it, it's, it's the uh, fight. Uh, with Teddy Atlas and Ken Ryder. It's not the Orson Welles. But we we might not pronounce the name always perfect, but we'll get out what has to be gotten out there as close to perfect as possible. And what I want to get out there is that Nganyu was this big, strong guy. You know, his body's a little bit more fit looking, although I thought Lou's looked pretty damn good, to be honest. But yeah. I, I've seen him look worse. But... I will tell you, and Ganya was crude in those areas, and he improved. It took him a couple of years after he lost to Stipe, but he, by the time he got in there for the rematch, he wasn't just a big, strong guy. He was, but he was a big, strong guy who was better with his technique, who was more advanced, more developed. That's what Luz needs somebody to help him develop in those areas the way Ganyu did. And if he does that, you might have a champion. You might have a, more than just a guy who could blast you out if you cooperate or, you know, and I say it again, if you cooperate or if you by accident cooperate and you get hit. But he'll get a, he needs more technique to go with his, his natural power. Uh, he needs more of a delivery system. Uh, but he didn't need it the other night. And again, explosive. He closed. He made his own delivery system. He delivered the paddock package. He was like FedEx. <laughs> Boom! I mean, right there, your doorstep. Matter of fact, FedEx doesn't go through your door. He goes through your door. That's the difference. That's the difference, Ken. He'll go through your freaking door. You want a package delivered? Don't call him unless you want your door smashed. <laughs> He'll get it to you. He'll get it to you, but then you, you got to fix your door. So... <laughs> He's everything I just said. And if he gets improved with his technique, look out. You got to look out now, but look out even more. Look out now. Look, 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 look out if he learns better technique. And the one thing I would start with him, just give him a good, reliable jab. Just give him that foam pole jab that George Foreman had that destroyed the great, late, great, Joe Frazier. Everyone knows the uppercut lifted him off the floor, Joe Frazier. But it was that jab that discombobulated him. That foam pole jab that that kept him under control by Foreman. That kept him, you know, dizzy. Uh, that, that kept him from getting himself together. That, that straight, powerful, accurate jab. And Lewis could have something like that. And it would, that alone, that alone would improve him significantly. And, um, you know, again, I, I see a lot of similarities with Nganyu, and then Nganyu got better in those areas. Uh, and I can see the same possibilities for, for Lewis. I know Nganyu's got a... He's really going to be tested. We're not going to go into that fight right now. But he's really going to be tested when he when he defends his title with the interim champion. Um, yeah, uh, surreal that, gun. Uh, yeah, gun. I mean, that's... That's 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 going to be very, very interesting because that is kind of like Babe Ruth or Hank Aaron meets. You know how they used to do those movies. Mm -hmm. um, the you know uh, Abbott and Costello meets uh, the cave uh, meets uh, the the Wolfman. Yeah. Uh, the werewolf, <laughs> uh, right? Uh, they meet Dracula. They meet Frankenstein. This would be Babe Ruth or, or like I said, the great Hank Aaron uh, meets Satchel Paige, <laughs> you know, or, or, or meets, uh, you know, 
Bob Gibson or meets, pick your greatest pitcher of all time. Whoever, who's your greatest pitcher of all time? Probably the Boston Red Sox guy. No, he betrayed you. Roger Clemens, he betrayed you. He left the Red Sox. That's right. I forgot. I forgot. It would have been Roger Clemens because uh, Red Sox, but he left just like you <laughs> forgot who Tom Brady is now. But um, whoever the greatest pitcher is, that's what it would be like. You got the slugger and then Ganyu meeting the great pitcher and gone. And um, it's going to be, oh boy, it's going to be interesting because great pitchers know how to disarm you. They know how to take the bat out of your hands. So it's going to be, it's really going to be interesting. But anyway, that Lewis, damn, he's explosive. <laughs> He, uh, yep. he should get a commercial. He should get... St- I don't know what commercial and what product can, but if I was his agent, it would some- be something that he smashes. <laughs> you know what yep. I mean? Some- yep, yep. Something that's... A- something that's explode like... <laughs> boom. You know, something that's explosive. Something that... Maybe an energy drink that wakes you up. Bang! Take this and you're, you're, you'll wake up. You know, uh, the way that... You have to be woken up after Lewis hits you, you know, with one of these. So <laughs> anyway, that's my part for helping him with his marketing. But it was, I'd like to, I'd like to see him learn to use a jab. Boy, it would almost be illegal to, <laughs> to, to teach him with that natural power and everything I just described to give him a jab. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the uh, Jake Paul card real quick. Um, on the undercard, just two fights I want to touch on. The first one is um, Frank Gore and Teron Williams. Um, Williams gets the gets the uh, decision in the exhibition. Um, <laughs> but this was like the definition of an amateur fight. Like it looked like a tough man contest at times. Initially, they first both came out looking to be in the right stance and stuff. But as soon as shots started getting fired, it was just complete chaos reminding me like i said of a tough man contest that uh that they used to have in like uh you know in in like a vfw or something two guys just get in the ring and stop mauling each other but uh how'd you like that one the, the frank gore 16 years in the nfl and then darren williams uh former nba player former two-time uh state champion in wrestling they went out there and they went for it but not the best exhibit not the best display of boxing skill i've ever seen all is well that ends well. What I mean by that is almost a little bit, we'll get to it later, but almost a little bit like Paul and Woodley except the way it ended. That, that wasn't a great display of boxing either, but a lot of people were about to be very disappointed in that, and then all that matters is the way it ended. And that's how these things are. That That's really what's attached to these, whatever you want to call them, exhibitions, these um you know th- these events that that's uh, how it ends but people just want in the end they want to see a splash <laughs> they want to see a splash like uh, somebody get you know splashed and uh nobody's going to say any of them are going to be real real pretty but they're hoping to get a splash and i i disagree with you just a tiny bit there were moments where gore looked like uh he was still hitting the sled you know, that football sled, or he was looking to tackle. He was a great running back. He, he had a great longevity, a great career, a great career with the 49ers and um, whoever else, but he, tremendous, and a gentleman. Um, and he, he, But there were times that he looked like he was getting ready for spring football, and, you know, because even though he's a running back, uh, every once in a while you might have to tackle somebody too. And it, it looked like he was... He was getting low and he was coming in there and he was about to tackle uh, Mr. Williams. But the thing that I find interesting, first of all, where I disagree with you a little bit, I thought they, I thought I give him respect, I give him appreciation, I give him uh, credit. They both went in the gym and did their best to learn the basics of boxing. And like you said, and you said it right. At the beginning, they came out with the right stances. Some of that got lost. And you could expect it. It's not their sport. They haven't been doing it the way they've been doing other sports. Fighters have been doing it for 10 years, 12 years, 15 years, whatever. And uh, they, they've they just started doing it. Um, so, obviously, they're, they're not going to be... They're not going to be able to retain their form 
when the pressure comes to to the to the utmost. But they didn't do bad. They even when they lost it a little bit, they got it back together. You could see that they they their corners told them something, whatever they told themselves something, and they they fought to get it back together to get their form back together. Uh, the way they knew that they practiced to have it. And again, it was never going to be great, but it, was, it wasn't it was bad, especially Williams. Williams kept his form better. He he really, he, he kept his form more consistently. The thing with Williams, he was so much taller, so much longer, that it reminded me when I was doing a fight for ESPN at ringside where I would talk about a guy needing to fight tall because he's taller and because he's longer. But you have to learn to fight tall. You can't just say, I'm going to fight tall. You got to learn to fight tall. And you can see the the mindset was to fight tall. He's taller. Williams, much taller. Fastball player. But he started out doing that. Then then he gave up his height. That the same way I would talk on ESPN, Ken. He gave up his height and just started coming forward, you know, into the territory that obviously would benefit Gore. And, but he re- he kept his hands up. He kept his form. He understood the jab was was going to set up the right hand. Um, Williams Williams did a fairly pretty good job considering that he's never done this before. And Gore didn't maintain his technique as well, but he, he wasn't horrible. Uh, there were spots where he got to where it looked like, again, that he was going back onto the you know, tackling, tackling drill. But other than that, he wasn't horrible. And there was more pressure on Gore and harder for Gore to retain his, to retain his technique uh, than it was for Williams because Gore was forced to be the one coming in, being the shorter man, even though Williams accommodated him by coming to him sometimes. But for the most part, he knew he had to come forward. And there's more of a burden on him. In, in that way, that he's got to feel that pressure and and be the one. When you do that, there's more chances you're going to make a mistake and chances you could get caught. There's more risk. Um, so mentally and technically, there's more pressure on you to have to have that responsibility. Uh, I thought, very honest, they were very honest. They went and they learned what they could and they went in there and did the best they could and Williams was so freaking honest. They they were trying so badly. Our man, Ariel, who does <laughs> Hawani, who does a great job. Was he was trying interview. so bad, so bad to get him to say that he's going to do another one, that he's maybe going to fight Paul, whatever. And and he's doing his job. And and Williams, Williams stuck to it. Uh, like I said, an honest guy. He said, listen, I'm one and done, baby. I I." wanted to prove to myself whatever that i could do this i i came here i did what i did and i'm not fooling myself to saying that i'm going further with it or that i'm going to be a champion fighter or i'm going to be this or that or i'm going to have a career whatever career this could be uh or that i'm going to try to go down that road no this this was this was my driveway. That's how long this road is. It's, it's to the end of my driveway. It's not up the highway. And and I went to the end of my driveway, and um, it was a great challenge, and, and I'm done. And it is a great challenge to face your fears, to get into that arena, to get into that chamber of truth, uh, that squared circle. It is a great challenge. And I give him credit for that. I give Gore credit for that. Um, so they didn't in any way... Uh, in any way embarrass themselves i don't think because i'm looking at it from all dimensions they're not pretending to say that they're gonna beat anybody in the world or they're gonna be uh, able to beat a professional fighter or any of that stuff they're, they're being very honest uh, that they're just doing it because there's an opportunity to do it and they want to challenge themselves and they're getting paid to do it so i i appreciate that um here's the interesting part for me a lot of people would automatically think that the football player would be the tougher mentally and the stronger guy. They would. They And I'm sure people, as I say it, are saying, yeah, you're right. Because of the sport they play. They're tackling people. They're, they're risking themselves more than basketball players do in a physical domain. Uh, that they would be tougher mentally uh, and, of course, physically um, than a basketball player. But you're wrong to assume that automatically and the tougher guy quite frankly 
was Williams, the basketball player. He was the guy that was a little tougher physically because, uh, not physically, mentally. And and, the, and there's a reason for it. Because how you are mentally don't, is, how do I say that? It's private. What I mean by that is it's got a lot to do with not only your vocation. It's got a lot to do with what you do, what your living is, what you practice. But it's got to do with what you've been through in life. The disciplines you faced. Uh, you know, one of the reasons Holyfield, of course, he was a fighter. But one of the reasons Holyfield was so damn tough, he had a mother. He'll tell you. He'll be the first one to tell you that made him be accountable of everything. If, if, if he got caught lying, simple thing like that, he, he got caught not facing something, not taking responsibility, he, he had a problem. And the problem he had was with a mother that he feared a lot more than the fighters he was getting into the ring with. I remember one time he told a story where she would take you back, they grew up in Atlanta, she'd take you back to the, to the shed where there were twitches, uh, switches, switches, they called them in the old days, in the old country days. And a switch was a, st I guess, a stick from a branch, right? It's like a, uh, it's like a long, uh, whippy branch of a bush where you take the, st the, the, the leaves and you pull all the leaves off and it's still got a lot of flex, not like a stick, more like, uh, like a vine or something, but it's firm and it like, it's like a whip. <laughs> It hurts. Oh. And um, it, it sounds like you know more about it than I would want to know about it. Um, I've been hit, by, I've been hit by a switch, well, a well, belt, take your pick. <laughs> well, we'll get more into that some other time, but it, it, it seems you know quite a bit about it. Uh, so, and she would let him pick which switch, basically, uh, he for his punishment of, of what he lied about, what he didn't face, what he didn't do, what whatever. And and he would have to face it. That made Holyfield. He'll be the first one today. He wrote a book, The Making of Holyfield. That'll be the first thing he'll tell you about. Yeah, it was the amateur fights. Yeah, it was the trainer in the gym that taught him how to fight. Yeah, it was f the fights, the amateur fights, the Olympics, the world title fights. Yeah, of course. But it was being forced by his mother to face things, to be accountable. And so no matter what your vocation Holyfield would have been, even if he wasn't a fighter, my point is, he would have been tough. <laughs> he, he would have been strong mentally because of that, that upbringing, that he had to face things instead of escaping things and, and finding ways around things. Kind of like I talked about Better Be of earlier. So, you know, same thing with Williams. Williams was a little stronger mentally. So it's, it's not just that he played basketball that he should be weaker mentally. No, he was stronger mentally because the attitude he played basketball with is part of it, but whatever it was that was part of his development as a human being, as a person, in his life. And I'll tell you another thing where you can't automatically say, well, a football player is going to be automatically tougher mentally, even though they tackle, they, they, they risk themselves, they, they face a tremendous threat with these guys coming at them to hit them. There's no doubt about it, and I got all respect for him. My son is in that world. And he has nothing but respect for him. He's in that world. The director, assistant director of scouting for the Las Vegas Raiders. He's there. He, he feels it. He sees it. But every day. But what I'm saying is that the difference from boxing with all these sports, basketball, football we're talking about, they got football. You got 10 other guys you can lean on, 10 other guys you could disappear with a little bit. You could share that with a little bit. Yeah, you can hide out a little bit. I'm not saying they hide out. They don't. But you, you, you can fall back on. You're not alone when, when those ninjas come. You're not alone when they come over that wall. And they come. They come, baby. But in the ring, you are alone. You are alone. You got to get stronger to face that. You are alone. There's nowhere to, I, I hate to use the word hide, but there's no, way, there's no place to even, you know, temporarily, uh, you know, uh, disappear. There, there's, there, there's no place. And you got 10 guys in a football field. In basketball, you got four guys with you where you could share that pressure where you could disperse it a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And what I'm saying is it comes down to your character, how it's been formed, whatever sport you're in. It comes down to that. So when you say, 
automatically. And I again, I would say you're wrong to assume that a basketball player is going to be mentally tougher than a football player. Not so fast. Sometimes they will. But not so fast that a football player is going to be mentally tougher than a basketball player. Not not so quick to jump to that assumption. And Brandon because, Marshall, again, Brandon Marshall was on the broadcast and he said he thought the football player had the advantage. And I'll just say that they forget that Darren Williams was a two-time state champion in wrestling. If you've wrestled for even one season, you know that feeling of that one-on-one battle where there's nowhere to hide and you're in there and you feel like you're exhausted and the other guy's wearing down on you and still trying to get you. You're tired. Unlike a sport like running, when you get tired, you just slow down. In wrestling, when you get tired and slow down, the other guy picks it up. He smells the blood. And that's the same thing. I think it's also crazy when people, I can remember playing high school sports and youth sports and you would think, When you were playing like a team from the posh suburbs, like, oh, these guys are weaklings. They're going to be weak minded and be kind of like pushover. And then you're reminded when you get in there with kids who are toughness doesn't know any like socioeconomic boundaries. I mean, look at a guy like Christian McCaffrey, Tom Brady. They grew up in really like posh type environments but when they get on the field they're tough because they're tough because it's in them it's not like and they were brought up a certain way with a certain discipline a certain something that developed those characteristics and and it's private yeah you're describing you're you're in you're describing and repeating what i just said i mean you're you're backing up what i just said that's right and it's true it's very true and i'm just telling you to finish off with the toughness part with basketball, football, whatever that we're using right now, the analogies, the comparisons, the basketball player, if, if it's a basketball player like like Larry Bird, like Michael Jordan, um, Michael Jordan's unbelievable. Yeah, he had talent, but how tough he was. That always wants the responsibility of taking that shot. Not because of ego, because of toughness, because of belief because of a sense of responsibility that he's going to make it and a belief that he's going to make it, that he's not hiding. And he's as tough as any football player in that domain, in the domain that yes. matters, the domain of winning, the domain of being tested. That's where it comes from. Now, if you got a football player like that, same thing. Same thing. But that's what I'm talking about. So you shouldn't make the assumption because of what people do. And you beautifully parlayed what I said. Beautifully. Yeah, if you come from the posh place or you come from, you know, the the, the worst places in, in on the planet uh, of poverty and, and all the things that unfortunately can come with that. Uh, yeah, either way, it's, it's not that. It's who you are and who you became and how you became that. And we all can become better stronger we can or we can let ourselves become weaker we can and we do and we don't sometimes we do and sometimes we say no we're not going to let that happen and i wanted to bring that out but to me it wasn't talking about the fight it wasn't the greatest fight we know that but it was talking about those aspects of it and customado you're going to find this interesting ken customado used to say to me that Teddy, the athlete that would make the best fighter, taking a cross-section athlete, if you will, to cross over. You know who he used to tell me would be the best one and he always wanted to prove it? Larry Bird. Basketball basketball player. Yeah, well, a a great basketball player. A a basketball player. Larry Bird would have been one of them. But uh, Michael Jordan, any of them. But a basketball player. He always said to me, and, and he said, Teddy, you get a basketball player. If you ever want to do something to really, you know, kind of shake the bushes, so to speak, and, and really do something different and challenging and, you know, a, a eye, eyeball awakening, if you will, uh, you know, to capture the moment of attention of people. You want to do something, get a basketball player and train them. But you obviously like anything you have to train him the right way you gotta have the time the dedication his dedication his commitment to it um and you might have something really really better than you would ever think and he he always felt that way he felt that way because if you get the right guy what does he mean by the right guy the right guy who has to be mentally tough too who has faced who wants to take the last shot who has faced those people who has formed himself into that kind of pressure person that can have 
pressure at breakfast time with orange juice and his uh you know his 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 scrambled eggs um it, it's got to be that person too not just the athlete but also the athlete cuz felt that their movements with their feet he said their abilities to, with their hands, to have quick hands and, and to be able to put their hands up for defense, obviously to, for offensive purposes, um, those movements, uh, he felt those athletic movements and abilities, he felt they fit into boxing, to making a good boxer. He really did. And, um, you know, there, were, there was a time when... Uh, I'm trying to remember. Well, there was a time when Will Chamberlain. They were talking about Will Chamberlain fighting Ali, and uh, <laughs> and that Anything you know they were talking buck. about that. <laughs> well, they were talking about it, and they were talking about. Of course, it didn't happen. Uh, I don't know if it was because he didn't have his contract signed with the Lakers yet, or or was it Philadelphia? Whoever it was uh, with Chamberlain <laughs> at the time, and and in that time they used it as a promotional thing, but. There was some seriousness in it. I, I'm trying to remember. I think Cuss, because I remember Cuss talking to me about it, that Cuss was going to be involved in Jimmy Jacobs um, uh, a little bit. I know definitely in the second one I'm going to mention. But anyway, like Cuss said to me, it all fell apart at a press conference, and it probably was never going to happen. But there was a press conference with a great Will Ch and he was great. I mean, he was a pioneer, the first great, 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 great big man uh only man to have a score 100 points in a game and uh when he people forget how great he was and a great volleyball player too but when he because you know it's gonna make you laugh but he said at the press conference they were talking and announcing it he said it, it fell apart when uh they were talking about it and they were they was getting them they were having him at the microphone and will chamberlain was there speaking and all of a sudden uh ali went up behind them and and whispered in his ear timber <laughs> 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 he, he went he went timber and and you know because of course you know kidding around with it but he said the fight was over there teddy the fight <laughs> the, the that was the end of the fight when he said timber but listen there was also a fighter from Philadelphia 76ers, Dawkins. Daryl Dawkins. Dawkins. Chocolate Thunder. They call it Chocolate Thunder, baby. And he was the first guy to really make it whatever you want to call it famous, you want to make it whatever they call, want to call it taking down backboards. Where, where that Smashed became... Smashed the backboard. He ripped the wind yeah, right off the glass. Yeah, that became the thing. <laughs> well, he was the guy that, that yeah. brought that to the forefront of the, such a thing and, and started making that, I don't know, something that became an event. Um, just smashing the freaking, taking the rims off the glass, the fiberglass of the backboard and um, delaying the game while they swept it up. And there was a period going on there, and Cuss and Jimmy Jacobs, Jim Jacobs was manager, best friends with Cuss, uh, supporter of Cuss for years, and of course the manager with Bill Caton of Mike Tyson before he died. And he, Dawkins was having a contract dispute, right? They were they negotiating a contract with the 76ers, and he wasn't getting what he wanted, so he started talking about being a fighter. I, I mean, people. I wonder if people out there remember this. And so they were talking about being a fight. Now, I think Dawkins used it for leverage for the contract, whatever. But they were talking about it seriously, or in a way we thought was serious. And Jim Jacobs got involved, and Consumato got involved, and I was going to be involved because I was going to train him. <laughs> because, cause, you know, I, I, cause I was Cus's trainer, and cause I did what Cus told me to do. And he said, you're going to be training this man. You're going to train him. And um, I said, in basketball? No, in boxing, you know. Uh, and um, I said, good, because basketball, you know, I'm not really, I don't think I'm really the guy that should be training him. But um, he said, no, yeah, but what a lot of people, what a lot of people might not know about you is that uh, you were actually a, a coach, an official coach for the Jets under, was it Mangini? Eric Mangini, Mangini, yeah, Tatterbaum was the GM, but Mangini was the coach. And the Smart great man. Teddy Atlas came in, was working with the linemen on footwork, mentality, mindset. A lot of people don't know that, and sometimes I got to remind myself, like, holy crap, that's right, Teddy was an NFL coach Three for years. a little while. Three years, Three NFL years. coach. That's pretty good. Cool. <laughs> what they get? What, what was that? Like a million, two million a year? 
Um, uh, somewhere like somewhere <laughs> a lot less than that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, some somewhere one or two million less than that. But anyway, uh, but close. The funny thing is, you mentioned Brandon Marshall earlier. He's a good man. Good person. He does yeah. charitable work. Well, he does good charity work. And it's funny since you brought me there when. When he played for the Jets at the end of his career or towards the end of his career. That's right. And one time at practice, I was out at practice and I was with the great Bobby April, the uh, the special teams coach, and we were talking and all of a sudden, Brandon Marshall, I had never met him, he came over and said, Teddy, will you train me? Will you train me? I'm, 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 I want to take boxing lessons or I'm taking boxing lessons uh, in Jersey. Would you would you train me? And I, I was, nope. <laughs> he could I, And I remember, he's a good guy. He's a really good guy. But I remember Bobby looking at me and saying, those guys are not used to people saying nope. That's they're, right. They're just not, they're not, you know, I said, no, I'm not training. Well, you won't train me? And he's got a, a great personality. Uh, a you're Teddy. <laughs> That I want to just say that it's funny to me when I hear, and believe me, I get so many comments on social media like, do you think Teddy would train me? And they go into a whole diatribe about how they, what, they're, they're worthy of it. And I'm like, I can't imagine how many requests you have. And I'll tell one funny story. I was working out at a boxing gym in New York, and I, I don't want to say who you were training, but I saw you training with this young guy, and I knew you were doing it as a favor because he was like, you know, he was good enough, but you know, maybe had two left feet. And you were in there like a like like a good friend, just working with him like he was training for the heavyweight title. And all I could think was like, man, Teddy is a good person. I can't believe he's in here in this like public gym working with this guy, but just speaks to the kind of person you are that, yeah, all right, I'll train you, even though I could see it was like probably took all your in intestinal fortitude to show up there every week but you did it and uh i never forgot about this, this is years before i even before we ever met and i remember wow what a good person because i can imagine all the real fighters that have approached and you were like all right for you i'll do you a solid and train you but anyway i digress uh, as we tend to listen, do no no <laughs> listen i appreciate those sentiments and saying that and i'll tell you who's a good person i said it already brandon marshall and i'll tell you yeah. why because Anyway, I said no, and he's like a kid. He was like no, and I said yeah, no, no, and um, he, you know, and then like I said, Bobby April, the great Bobby April, one of the great special teams coaches. He was like, he was laughing. He was like, that was great, and and but we became friends. So he took my phone number, or whatever I gave my. He asked for my phone number. I gave it to him, and I don't know. He called me up, and. He called me up. I gave him my phone number. He gave me his too, and um, I was gonna train him. I was gonna. I I would have found a way to train him for a couple times, but it it never between my schedule his and we never got it. But here's the thing: I give a humanitarian award out with my Dr. Atlas Foundation, where we help people, uh, we help the families that need help the most, that fall through the cracks, and they have a child that needs a surgery that the insurance doesn't pay for it, specialized surgery for a doctor, we, we step in, we'll pay for it. Or or there'll be something there'll be something where um you know, something along those lines or we run food pantries for the families unfortunately that aren't able to get all the foods they need for their family or, you know, if a family needs a wheelchair or whatever. So I we do it once a year. You guys have been good enough to come to the last couple of dinners. You flew all the way in. I never forget that. Yeah, you talk about showing that you're a good person. There it is. We Came would right never. We would never ever miss that. It's and it's, uh, Rob Moore. We would never miss it. We we enjoy being part of. We're we're like a family here, and uh, I know people uh, say please. stuff like that, but it's the truth. And, and 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 the important reminder is like you know you don't even you can have disagreements within your family, but at the end of the day, you know that when the chips are down, these people are gonna be there. Even if even if even if you want to choke us sometimes, I know you know that when the chips are down, we're gonna be there someone's <laughs> you got a body you need buried we're gonna be there we're not gonna agree with you but hey all right oh, you did what you did let's get rid of this body quickly um <laughs> <laughs> well, we didn't have to go there but i appreciate it i, have, we I would. appreciate uh bring the line bring the line <laughs> but i uh, <laughs> I appreciate it. I know what you're saying. Uh, for those people out there that go and nuts down, please calm down. Calm down a little bit. All right. 
That's I mean, why I he always tell someone his, he does keep. Yeah, he is. He is from Boston, and he does, and from a certain neighborhood in Boston, and he does keep a shovel in his trunk. That doesn't mean nothing. <laughs> that doesn't mean nothing. When people right? ask me about someone, like, hey, seriously, what do you think of this guy? I'm like, honestly, if he asked me to help him bury a body, I'd probably do it. That's how much I like him. So uh, that's a, that's nice. <laughs> that's a nice thing. I appreciate that. And here's, listen, Brandon Marshall. I gave him a humanitarian award, which means an awful lot to me. And it's to be given to somebody who uses their position, their abilities of being in position uh, to have resources that others don't have to help people, simply to help people. And Brandon Marshall has a foundation that does that. And uh, I think it's for kids that have bipolar, those kind of... uh, those kind of situations and those kind of illnesses along those lines, and he does that. So I asked him one year, I said, will you accept my uh, the Dr. Atlas Foundation uh, Humanitarian Award? And he said, yes, and he came, and he came to the dinner. And he was, a, he was tremendous, like all the people that are good enough to come to my dinner, the celebrities. He was loved by everybody, and he's, he's, he was tremendous. And um, so... And he has taken boxing, you know, and um, so he he was the right guy to have there for that kind of event where you, it's like a celebrity event. It's not, mm-hmm. you know, a professional boxing match, obviously. And to have them there because he's done some boxing, because he admires fighters, uh, and because, you know, what what he's doing. He's commenting on some things that people have never done before that are going into a new arena and what does that mean it means it takes a certain kind of character a certain kind of ability to find a way to do something new and at the end of the day what does it really come down to yeah athleticism all that stuff but you're in a whole different form you're in a whole different arena so what does it comes down to it really comes down to having the guts to try something new and maybe embarrass yourself to have that that guts to do that and the ability to get in the ring and find a way to find a way to overcome something that's new to you and he he was the perfect guy and i'll tell you why i'm going to throw a curveball at you but he overcame something this guy's a great nfl football player and he suffered from bipolar he suffered from 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 these kind of illnesses, mental health illnesses, just, the worst, yeah. of the, the worst of all uh, the illnesses, because it's suffering this in man, silence. This man, this man, almost lost his life because of it, his family, yep. Yep. his career, everything, and he faced it. He had to face it to get help. You know, he had to face it to allow himself to get help, and he did. That's a great man. That's a winner. Yeah. Forget about football. Forget about boxing. That's a winner. That's a winner. Agreed. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about these ingredients, about these dimensions of character, these these other talents, these other abilities, these other places. That's what I'm talking about. And I just want to, I didn't know I was going to say this today, but Brandon Marshall, I don't think the people that hired him knew any of this, but he's the perfect guy to understand such things, what it takes to face something that's hard to face for the first time in your life. Because he did it, yeah. not just on the NFL field which he did it on the nfl field too to a to a great level to a high level but getting back to finish up on you know to finish up on the uh on the fight uh you know it was i thought it was three to one the decision uh for williams over uh but again i i didn't really think i know they're not going on to be uh (laughs) heavyweight contenders but i didn't think they embarrassed themselves that's why i wanted to take the time uh because they were honest about it and because they did their best to be the best they could be um and and again i wanted to i want to get rid of the fallacies the the assumptions that oh because you're you come from, you brought it on, good. You come from this side of town or you come from that side of town or because you look this way or you talk this way or you look that way or you talk that way or, you know, because you're a football player, not a basketball player or, or because, you you know, you, you like to dance where, where all the tough guys in, in school, uh, they don't dance, they go and do the No, that, 
That is not what defines you as far as toughness. Not even close. Not even close. What defines you as far as toughness is what you're willing to face. <laughs> what you're freaking willing, how honest you can be with yourself and how accountable you can be and you can make yourself be to prepare for whatever it is that you have to face. That's what makes you tough. Not any of the other stuff. That's window dressing. That's BS. In that regard, <clears throat> my oldest and my youngest sons love gymnastics. They love flipping and tumbling. And they go to a um, gymnastics place that also has dancing in there. And it tends to be a ton of little girls when you show up. And they were, and my, but my son loves it. He loves flipping and the oldest in particular. And the little one is actually really good. That He's six and the older is 10. And they're like, Dad, I, I feel uncomfortable. It's like kind of like girly there. And I said, listen to me. The tough guy doesn't worry about what anyone else thinks. The tough guy just goes and does what he wants to do. You enjoy tumbling and, 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 and doing flips and stuff? How else are you going to learn? Don't worry about what anyone else thinks. You only have to worry about what you think. That's where character and toughness is built. Disregard what anyone else thinks. And if someone thinks, oh, you're not that tough because you take tumbling. Well, if they say it to you enough and it bothers you enough, you can give them a smack and deal with it and say, how's this for toughness? Because sometimes you're going to lose... But I guarantee you, you smack one person, no one's ever going to say it again because they're like, I don't really want to get smacked in the face. Even if I can beat the crap out of that kid, no one wants to fight. So listen, do what you want to do. Live your own life. If you're worrying about the opinions of others, you're going to have a long, dull life. People that, are, people that succeed and do things off the beaten path at some point take risk and take chances and they're not overly concerned about the opinions of other people because those people might be interested in doing that but they're scared of the same things you're scared of. Like, the, like walking into a boxing gym for the first time. It's not exactly the most welcoming place. It's not like you come in there and they're popping off uh, noisemakers and champagne like, oh, thank God you're here. We've been waiting for you. No, it's very unwelcoming and intimidating. But at some point, every great champion that you see on TV walked into a gym for the first time. And at some point, I guarantee you, everyone was scared. And at some point, they all sparred for the first time and were scared. And if they say they weren't, they're lying. Everyone, and if you're not scared, like you've said before, something must be wrong with you. But to that I end, had one thing to that. Go ahead. And they're still scared. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they but they learned to live with it more comfortably. That's right. Because they understand it better. And they know how to control it better. That was beautifully said. Um the last thing I say about the football and basketball player and, and these crossover boxing events, whatever they are, events, right? Um and entertainment. I'll say the last thing. I didn't think Gore looked uh, and Williams looked all that bad. I thought Gord, a couple times, he threw a right hand. He he set it up over the jab of uh, the taller Williams. Williams got too close, and he timed him with a right hand over it. And, and that was smart because you want to control a guy's jab, especially if he's long and tall. He's going to use it as his predominant weapon. You want to try to take it away. There's no better way to take it away than to counter with a right hand and make him tentative you know, to throw it. I mean, that, that was smart by Gore. The other way is to use your own jab. Gore also jabbed to the body and then set up a right hand uh, to the head. And he threw, them, he threw them pretty good. And, of course, I thought Williams was a little better in those areas. He was a little more consistent in those areas. The one thing that turned the fight, the tide of the fight, was somebody should have reminded Frank Gore, who I have a lot of respect for, but they should be reminding him that there's no timeouts in boxing because he was in <laughs> the corner, okay? <laughs> that turned the whole fight. I know. He was in I the know. corner. That was the only 10-8 round. That's He's a in perfect the example of the inexperience of being like, oh, guys, he hit me with a good shot. You, He should know to back off. Like in a sparring session, you hit exactly, someone a good Ken. shot, you're not going to jump him. And he thinks, I'm. Uh, it's like his condition is, oh, man, you got me a good shot. Hold on a second. Oh, my God, you're minute. still hitting me? Wait a minute. We'll, we'll get back to that. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, yeah, no, protect yourself at all times, like they say in boxing. And he yeah. learned that lesson the hard way. He loosened up, sure. bang. <laughs> Williams took advantage. He caught him with a right hand, and then the, he, he got an eight, a 10 8 round. He won three rounds to four anyway, um, yeah. I, I believe. But that was the one turning point, or the one, maybe not turning point, but that, that was the one real definitive point where he, somebody really got caught uh, because of that. Uh, but. Otherwise, the last thing I'll say is this. 
Offensively, they didn't look too bad. They got a little sloppy. I get it. But they learned the basics. Where it becomes hard with these events, Ken, where you're teaching a guy from another sport in a short period of time, and then the pressure comes. They might look good on the bags. But then when the pressure comes, when <laughs> exactly. getting comfortable in an uncomfortable environment in that ring, um, when that comes, it it, it it becomes really hard that's because exactly the air goes right. out of the room. Yep. The air goes out of the room. That That's the thing. That's called experience, having experience in that area. Nothing is going to make up for that. You know, the guys who have had more discipline in their life and faced more things, they're going to be a little better at it. But you got to get that experience. But the, the other thing I say is, the offense can look okay. Where they have problems is the defense because the defense is something. I take a kid off the street. The one thing he's going to do, he's going to throw punches. He's, he's naturally going to throw punches to defend himself. He, he, he's seen it before and he knows what it looks like. He's going to throw punches. What he's not going to do is slip punches and weave punches that's exactly, and block you're exactly, punches so That's well. exactly right. Uh, Anyone, that, you take a great athlete, a professional athlete, you can make them look like a world champion on the pads in the bags in six months or a year of hard training. But like you said, how do you look when someone's right in front of you and throwing punches just as aggressively and just as smoothly as you are? All of a sudden, you're like, holy shit, I didn't expect I was going to get hit that hard in the face. He's really trying to hurt me. That's when, to me, the whole game plan goes out the uh, out the window. Like people have said for years, everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face. But nothing is more real than when you get punched in the face and the guy's still trying to throw in a real fight, unlike sparring. Where, oh, you got me a good one. Give me a breather here. Okay. I know it's like... All right. Well, the, the, and the defensive side of it takes more teaching. It's yeah. more technical. It's something that has to be taught more than, in some ways, more than the offensive side. But, and it takes more discipline, as we just touched on. It takes more control. You know, you can throw an undisciplined punch to a certain extent, and maybe you get away with it. But to be able to slip a punch, not pull away, you know, not bend forward where you, where you just you know fall in and trying to not see the punch coming i mean to be able to make a proper defensive move it takes teaching and it takes more control than it does even on the offensive side to control yourself and face a punch coming where the tendency is to pull away from it to yeah. stand there and slip it or or weave it instead of doing what nature tells you to do or what you you know what you're what your the fear your emotions are telling you or pulling you to do it so that's that's why you see guys that they could be okay offensively but the defensive side always comes 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 later so that's yep. that's my take on that let's um let's touch quickly on the co-main with amanda serrano yeah, and uh yeah, miriam fast, gutierrez before we do though i just want to say we mentioned ariel hawani earlier i love seeing him on these on these broadcasts i yeah, think he too. got He's i good. think he got a horrible horrible deal with the way espn treated him and one hand they let him do some nba stuff which i love to see because he's a huge basketball fan espn they, has treated a few people not real great i mean 100%. and hawani was one of them 100 percent and they have a history of doing that to some of their talent and uh, so I loved seeing him out there I loved seeing him in the interviews I spoke to him briefly via text after Jake Paul at the way and was screaming that he was going to F him up I'm going to F him up right in his face and I said I like the way you just maintain your coolness and just went on with your next question because I was getting nervous as this guy was screaming in your face but anyway um, interestingly he's a, so, he's a real pro, he's a pro. I, I love him it was interesting. Amanda Serrano was uh, promoted by Lou DiBella. It would, uh, at some point, it would be fun to have Lou on here explain how uh, how she got out of that contract with him. But nevertheless, I digress. She's out of the contract being promoted by Jake Paul and his team now. So she put it on him. Um, Gutierrez, I mean, pummeled her all 10 rounds. Her, Gutierrez's face looked just a, a mess. I mean, I like Amanda Serrano personally. She's a good person. I, I I did a radio show with her once. I like her. She's really close with Rosie Perez. And uh, nevertheless, she put it on her. She's calling for Katie Taylor next. I'd, that's a fight I'd love to see. But a lot of, um, lot of behind-the-scenes stuff there with that whole situation that probably... I would probably favor Taylor a little bit. She might be a little 
uh, it'd be a good fight. They're both really win- they they're both tough. They both tough. have attitudes of winning. Yeah. Um, uh, Katie's got more experience in amateurs with the Olympics. She won a gold medal in the Olympics. She's got more experience in those areas. Um, Serrano's but, had a handful uh, of, of of MMA fights in Bellator. She, that's yeah, like, yeah. She is. Yeah, I mean, it'd be very interesting, very tough. I think the technical side, they're both pretty good, pretty darn good. Katie might be a little better defensively. Um, might have more dimensions to her where she could box a little bit more but it would be a hell of a boy that would be but you want it soon because they they both in tough fights katie's been in a lot of tough fights you don't want it where they're diminished you want it yeah. now now sounds like they're gonna get it so anyway how'd you like that one uh gutierrez showed a lot of guts i mean she just got pummeled from pillar uh, to post from start she's to the kind of girl that they talk about when they talk about guts that someone with real guts someone who behaves like a real fighter needs to be protected from herself that's good to yeah. she needs to be protected from herself she needs the good people around to whether it's to stop fights or whether it's to shorten her career or or whether it's to teach her to move ahead better or to be better to, uh, from a technical standpoint where she doesn't have to take as many beatings as she does or as many punches. I got a question does. for you along those lines. She's taken a beating and she does land, she catches Serrano occasionally with a big shot. But what I saw, if I'm in the corner, I'm like, okay, we've caught her with three or four at least of our best shots and Serrano wasn't even remotely phased. At that point in the like later rounds, do you just say to her like, listen, enough's enough. I don't think you could hit her with a hammer at this rate. I don't think you're going to stop her and we're just going to get continue to get beat up. Would you have ever considered if you were in the corner of Gutierrez being like, that's enough. You're way outclassed and you, you can't hurt her. If I don't think my fight has a chance to win and they're getting hit and they're getting hurt, yes. Uh, if I don't think they can win and they're getting, yes. I, I, I don't want them to take unnecessary punches if they can't win, but it's a fine line of getting to that place where you really believe that they don't have a chance to win, but you have to know your fighter. You have to know what kind of punches she is. You got to know your opponent. You have to be able to weigh all of those factors and, and do it fast and do it in a proper way because it's a decision for a lifetime. Yeah. So it's not an easy thing, but what I would, what I always tell fighters when they can't hurt someone or don't hurt somebody to the head is more, go to the body, concentrate more on the body. You know, that changes things. Yeah, yeah, they're taking a great shot to the head. Let's, let's see if that changes when when we hit them underneath to the body. And it does change sometimes. Uh, so that would be my first technical advice uh, from a physical technical standpoint. Uh, let's test it to the body now and see what happens. And and again, not, don't catch them one punch, but catch them three, you know, to put them together. But, but the body would be a big part of it. But listen, the only thing I really, I think that I really want to touch, I think we talked about it already uh in the areas that we need to for this fight um the only the only thing that bothers me a little bit that i want to say is that i'm not even saying just this fight what bothers me in my profession that you know i've been in almost 50 years now and i spent eight years up a custom auto up in catskill developing fighters one of them turned out to be tyson but there was a lot of fighters way before that that we've work with and world champions like Wilfred Benitez that I trained when I was like 20 I don't even know 22 years old he fought I trained him for the Palomino fight outdoors in Puerto Rico when he won the welterweight title I think Benitez was one of the greatest fighters of all time he won three different division weight division titles uh you know so I uh, one of the things that bothers me is that I don't think everyone deserves to be a trainer. I'm sorry, or be in that corner. I, I, I wish there was a way to test them better. I mean, I don't just, I love football. I love football. My son's in it. But but my son's been in it for like a, a half a lifetime already. I mean, he's he's earned his right to be in it and to, to be in where he is. I haven't done that. You know, I, I watch football. I appreciate it. Uh, but I can't be a coach. On the sideline, I, I, I haven't heard the right to be that. I, I was a coach, if you want to use that word loosely, uh, coaching for three years, uh, the Jets. Uh, but I wasn't coaching the game on the sideline. I was enhancing their physical abilities during the season and during training camp where you know I was enhancing things that they needed to use on the field. Um, but mentally getting a better to face, if you want, 
the uh, the dark rooms, uh, the the dark places that we can all go to when we're under pressure. Football players need help in that area too. Uh, I would do that. Work on their technique as far as their footwork, their agility, their balance. Even for the linemen, punching out where you have to get your arms out there, the offensive lineman to keep the defensive lineman off you. Don't raise your elbows first. You lose your power and you lose a split second. Shoot it straight out uh, where you got more power. Get it to the right range where you get it off at the right time instead of a split second too late where the guy's into you already. I could teach those things, those technical things. But I didn't belong, and I wasn't, but I didn't belong on the field teaching X's and O's of football and and being able to set up a game plan, you know, of football and telling a, a quarterback what play to call and telling a lineman what blitz to call. I, I didn't deserve that. I couldn't do that. And of course, it's not allowed, and it's not allowed in any of the other sports either. Uh, you see people on the on the sidelines in football, they've been in that sport learning and doing an internship and, you know, earning their way for years through high school, through college, and then the pros. Uh, that's how they got there, and that's why they're there. Whether it's basketball, football, baseball, golf, you know, tennis, whatever it is. But in my sport, can it bothers me. I see I see people in the corners that become friends with the fighters. They get in the gym. They talk their way in. They get around. And they have no background. They don't have a proper background. They haven't They haven't earned their way. They haven't served an apprenticeship, an internship. And they're in there with fighters in a serious, serious business that you can get hurt and you do get hurt. And they're in there as the coach, as the mentor, as the leader, <laughs> uh, uh, the guy that's the general during wartime, giving orders, and and they they know they know about as much about doing that as I do about making a tuna casserole. <laughs> I, I, I love tuna casserole. Know. Well, yeah, but I actually might know a little more about tuna casseroles than 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 some people. But I've seen my wife make them, and they are good. I um, love them. But I mean, I. But I, I wouldn't be a tuna casserole expert. You know, you I don't think you'd want to eat my tuna casserole, to be quite frank. But I, I, the point is, I see people in my business that don't deserve to be there, that don't know jack you-know-what really about what they need to know about helping a fighter when a fighter most desperately needs help and advice. Uh, they don't. And I'm watching, I'm not just talking about this fight, but some of this fight, and I'm watching and seeing this fight, this gallant warrior like Serrano come back all beaten up, her nose is all swollen, her face is all swollen. I mean, she needs help. She needs she needs advice. You just brought it up, actually. She needs advice, and she comes back to the corner, and they're not getting that kind of advice. I mean, uh, you know, they're getting advice like uh, keep going. Uh, you like know, Teofimo she, Lopez's advice when he was getting beat like, up yeah, by, <laughs> by absurd Kimbosos. Yeah, yeah, like like uh, go get him, get this that mother effer, get him I, out of there. Uh, okay, get that out of there. What? Say that again, <laughs> slowly. Uh, what? Dad, um, sh dad, oh, it's too I late. The bell rang. Should, dad, should I, I get him? I out mean, of there? a customer used to say, "Teddy," uh, he goes, "It used to burn him too." He'd hear these guys with a tough fighter in a corner, and they'd come back, and and Cus would say to me, "And you know what they told him? Throw a million punches." What? What? <laughs> what? Throw a million? What? And then I used to joke with Cus. I used, "Well, what happens if the other corner tells him to throw a million and one? <laughs> then what?" Then what happens? Cuz start like, laughing. Listen, this is serious business. This ain't a joke. He goes, yeah, the whole idea is you're not one of you're never gonna be one of those guys that says throw just throw me in part. And but that's that's what that's what they do. And you see a girl like this come back all swollen up and should be I don't remember what it was, but should be told something like, uh, you're getting to her. No, you're not. Or or uh put more pressure. Put more pressure. I mean, how much more pressure? Could, can you tell me how to put pressure without getting beaten to and death? Coach, I every, mean, time I, I put, every time I put pressure, she smashes me square in the jaw. What should I yeah, do then? Stuff, <laughs> so it just bothers me that I see these gallant, gallant, gallant warriors that do their job, but 
they don't have help from the person that's supposed to be doing their job. And they're all alone. They don't. They should be able to get some help. And I don't only, only mean in the help of technical help, because that's what I'm talking about. But also, if they're not able to give that help, do you think that they could give advice to when you should stop fighting, to not get hurt, to, to retire, to, you know, that... Uh, that you're going down a road that's going to end in a bad dead end, you know, uh, of of not accomplishing what you want to accomplish, but doing more, but doing damage to yourself where there's no payoff. Do you think they have that kind of ability to uh, to be able to give you that kind of advice if they can't tell you to move your head, or they can't tell you to block a jab? Or they can't tell you to, you know, <laughs> to move to the side instead of coming straight in. It, it, when I see it, I don't see it in other sports. I don't see it in football. You, you have people in the corner that are not qualified. And I just wish there was a way of testing them, finding out, really. But boxing isn't organized that way. Where you would have a mandate to only have people in the corner that have the experience to be in the corner, that have the ability to be given a license that they're entitled to get, that they deserve to get, to be, I mean, to get a driver's license, you got to pass a test. Boxing, you don't have to pass nothing to get a trainer's license. It's absurd. Yeah. And, and again, you don't see it in the other sports. You don't see it in football. You don't see it in basketball, baseball, golf, tennis. Yeah. You know, any of those. I think some of those bowling. more established sports, though, they have a hierarchy that you have to earn your right through. But to your point, if you get a really good, skilled athlete who's into boxing, you're right. People can worm their way into the into the inner circle, and next thing you know, they're uh, in the corner in between rounds. Ken, I, and I've like, seen too many like- people. I've seen it. I've lived it in Gleason Gym in Manhattan years ago when I came down from Catskill. In Brooklyn, I, I seen these guys that one, you know, one minute they're delivering bread, the next minute they're training a fighter, you know, in the corner. And the bread was stale. The bread was stale. Well, if you need okay? an example of how deadly, if you need an example of how serious this, serious this uh, is, let's jump into the main event and talk about the um, Paul Woodley result because the end of that fight was honestly as scary as you like when it comes to combat sports. To get someone knocked out and land on their face with their arms at their side and to have their whole body like lock up in that in that unconscious position when someone's first knocked out where everything kind of seizes up. Honestly, it was scary and we watched the sport because we like it and people like knockouts, but I don't think that anyone in their right mind is looking to see someone get hurt. And I mean, for Woodley, my God, I couldn't think of a worse outcome in terms of uh, a proud former UFC champion to, you know, fight this guy with not a lot of experience and to have it end like that. And credit to Paul. I know you're going to get into the technicalities of it, but I think he set him up perfectly. He kept faint in him. He looked down. I know I, I, he, he got him, his hands looking down. He got him right where he wanted him and just landed a punch that someone who's more experienced and skilled doesn't get caught with that shot but my god he put everything behind it knocked them out cold like i said face down i mean perfect ending to this to the year for um jake paul worst ending for woodley i mean aside from the money which is always always nice i think he made a lot of money jake paul gave him a rolex watch before the before the fight etc cetera, etc cetera. but um dying to hear your thoughts on this one it looks very much like the like the first fight at, at, at at times during the first few rounds, I was like, man, this is a little bit boring. Enough with the clinching and grabbing and wrestling and dirty boxing. And, but man, did they end it emphatically with a big giant knockout. And uh, been dying to hear your thoughts on this. Prior, uh, Regardless of what anyone else thinks, we never really talk about the fights prior to jumping on here. For, specifically, because I want to give my thoughts from a fan's perspective. And then hear Teddy's thoughts from the analyst perspective and real boxing um you know, savant, and and hear what a, a true analyst and, and professional thinks of the action that took place. So with that, how'd you like it? What'd you see? All right. It, the, it was, the knockout came in the sixth round. It was two rounds away from the gravy train ending. That's, we tell, I That's like it point. or not, get right to the point. Two rounds away 
from the gravy train ending, stopping right yep. in mid track, not not getting into the station. I mean, whatever many you made, count it, put it away, call your accountant, uh, make sure the investments are good, get IBM, get all good solid <laughs> blue chip stocks. Get some, get you some know, make, income yielding fixed income so yeah, you can like live on yeah, the interest. Yeah, talk to Kenny, <laughs> talk, call Ken Ryder, uh, call Ken Ryder out because, because the, the train has stopped. That's where it was. It was it was ugly. It was sloppy. Um, you uh, you if you came here to hear something else, you came to the wrong place. And you know what? If you've been here and you keep coming here and you're coming, more people you're spreading the word, and our subscribers keep growing and growing. We're we're at like two hundred sixteen thousand subscribers, 17. over forty million. 17,000 even more two than I thought yep. uh, 217 217,000 subscribers f over 40 million downloads I mean th there's a reason people are passing the word around because you're going to hear the truth yeah, you're gonna hear. You might not like what you hear, but you're gonna hear the freaking truth. The freaking truth. And you're not gonna hear people talk that have agendas that that is trying to sit on the middle of the fence or sit on one side or the other because they of a friendship or because they want a job or because they want to howl for the meals. No, no, there's no howling going on over here. You know, I can't get a job, so forget about it. I mean, that's been proven. Uh, I, I've burned too many bridges. I've, I've, I've. <laughs> I've, I've, I've told the truth too often. Whatever. And I can't get fired over here. So, so there is no fear to pull me one way or the other. Just the truth. They, Paul's a genius. And, he's, and him and his brother. And they've made money. And I give them credit for it. They went out there. They respected the sport. They worked hard. They learned what they had to learn. And they've, they found an audience. Uh, they, they built an audience. It's a phenomena. But they, they found an audience basically, like I said before, The Matrix, the movie The Matrix, where it became real for people, where, where these YouTubers that live in The Matrix, that live out there vicariously, you know, uh, the way they do playing YouTube, now they can live vicariously through the Paul Brothers, where they can take their YouTube stuff and their dreams, and you know, everyone wants to be something. Everyone wants to have hope. Everybody wants to be able uh, to become the guy, uh, to dream, to, to be more. In some ways, almost almost in some ways like the nerds, where, where you got the nerds in school, and they're good guys, they're good, but they're special too. But then you got the the ball players, uh, the the athletes, and they're making fun of the nerds. Like, get out of here. You got no place over here, you nerdy, nerdy, nerdy. And all these YouTube guys, I'm just using that as an example because it gets to the point. It's not exact, but it gets to the point where all these guys are YouTuber guys who aren't out there doing other things, but they're doing that. They have a love. What's wrong with that? Nothing. They have a passion. What's wrong with that? Nothing. They have, they, they have a desire. What's wrong with that? Nothing. And they're out there, and that's their desire. That's what they like. And then, But they don't quite fit in. Now, all of a sudden, that guy who's a YouTuber, he not only fits in, he gets on a stage, he gets in a ring, he can start yelling outlandish stuff, and he can back it up with his fists. Uh, at least to the point that you know you you, you feel that he can and and he, and all of a sudden you're you're attached to that he's your guy he represents you you're not a nerd anymore it's it's the revenge of the nerds the revenge <laughs> of the nerds <laughs> That's a good description. Yeah. The crazy thing is Jake Paul's just playing a nerd. He's not, a, a nerd is like something you decide you want to be. Like I told my friends, my running friends, like I'm the king of the nerds. I'm the biggest nerd. We're all nerds. We're running. Like no one's going to hit us. And I think all Jake Paul plays of being that a nerd. role. He's like, yeah, I'm dressing like a nerd. Beautiful. He ain't, he ain't Beautifully. A nerd. And he, and he represents, he's got an army yes. and he represents them. He's, he's their guy. That's and that's right. the phenomena. That's what he's building. That's his genius. And he is a genius. And and he's playing it. He's he's stoking it. He he's he's taking a little flame and making it into a roaring fire. And and all of that, all of that, oh, and then the millions of dollars that's come with it. The train was about to come up and stop. The track was finally going to run out because he wasn't going to be able to say all these bombastic things and you know that's part of the energy that's part of what drives his train you know that's part of what fuels his fire he wasn't gonna be able to say these outlandish things whatever you want to call them you earn the right to say them he was gonna lose the right to say them but what was going on there for you know 
five, what was it, five rounds. Uh, what, what round? They got stopped in the fifth. So it was going on. Was it the fifth round it got stopped? Yeah. So it was go, right, fifth round it got stopped, I believe. I believe. It was. Let me just no, me. sixth round, sixth round. So it was, so for five and a little bit more rounds, you know, he was losing the right to continue this, this journey, this train ride, you know, and he was going to run out of track. And then all of a sudden, he lands that bomb that puts more track in front of him. The train continues now. It's very similar to what happened in a real fight. Well, this was a real fight too. Consequences are real. But with professional fighters Got him in the at high round. levels. Yeah. What happened with Wilder and Fury in that first fight why do, Fury's a different man now. He's a multi, 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 multi millionaire. He could be a billionaire soon, and he's the one of the most famous people on the planet. He's he's a star, a rock star. Uh, you know, he's a champion. You know, he's he's all of those things for one reason, because he got up when he got dropped that last time in the 12th round against Wada, and it looked like he was shot by like a 12-gauge shotgun and he was just laying there and the referee was the right ref because he didn't panic and just wave his hands. He looked at him, he got down on his knees like a ref's supposed to do and he started counting as he's looking at him and he saw something that allowed him to continue counting as a professional, not an amateur, not a guy who just panics and just says, no, it's over. No, it's not over, maybe, because men are special. Women are special. Humans are special. Sometimes they can go to special places, and Fury did that night. But the reason why Fury is here, in the way that he's here, with all these millions of dollars and everything that comes with it, it's because he got up. The reason why the train continues for Paul is because he landed that right hand. And to his and it was and it was ugly, it was sloppy all the way till that. But to his credit, where he has gotten advanced a little bit, where people probably don't give him credit, is that he's gotten to a place where in the sixth round of an ugly fight, he could still be calm enough and learn to be calmer now and calm enough and collected enough mentally and emotionally in an uncomfortable place, in a scary environment, where he could see the opportunity to do that, and he could think. i say it again. He could be in control enough to think of doing it, to think of doing it. That was a professional move. A lot of the other ones weren't that great earlier in the night. That was a professional move. He dipped a little bit. He actually shook his right hand. There's a lot of conspiracy theorists out there. I'm going to handle it right now that <laughs> that said it was a tip off. It was a setup. It was a con job. You know, it was uh, it was the Sting. Remember that movie, The Sting. Yeah, the Sting. That was a great with Robert Redford and and uh, and and um, uh, what's his name, Paul Newman. Where that was a great movie. And so. He, he shook his hand, then he stepped back, then he came in. There's people that said that was the tip-off. When he shook his right hand, um, as soon as he did that, that was, telling, that was telling Woodley, get ready to take the flop. And then he <laughs> stepped back. Then he, no, I'm telling you, there's a video out there. Ken, people are, I know, I've video. seen it. People are insane. I, I, I'm like telling you. Uh, Rob's like, going to find it. Rob's going to find it. There's a video out there. We bring you everything on this show. Everything. The, uh, he, he, there's a video that says that was the setup. He shook his hand. He stepped back and came in. And that was, the, that was the signal for Woodley at that point to take his uh, flop and, and make his money. So... Um, no, you know what he did that? First of all, it might have been just a habit. Uh, the great champion, what's the great champion's name? The, the, um, he was a featherweight, bantamweight, featherweight, junior lightweight champion. Then he moved up to lightweight. He got knocked out by Davis. Um, I called his fights on ESPN, actually. Some um, uh, Santa Cruz. Now, Santa Cruz used to do that. I broke it down on ESPN, Ken, where 
nobody had noticed it, but he's got a habit of doing this, yeah. shaking his right hand, shaking his right hand. He doesn't even know he's doing it. It's just a habit. And he used to do that all the time. So before one of his fights, when I was doing the fight plan and breaking it down, I said, look, if the guy that's fighting Cruz would look at film, his corner, his people, that's why you got to have the right people with you. If, if they could look at the film like you look at football film, you know, before football game, get ready for the team or whatever. You you look at film of a pitcher to see what his pitches are before you, before you get ready to, you know, as a hitter to face them. So you know what you're facing. If they would look at this, they would make a plan where I would, every time he shook his hand, I would attack that side, the right side of Santa Cruz, the left side of the opponent. I would attack that side because while he's doing this, he can't punch. So it's basically taking it out of play. It's like you're taking that punch out of play for a split second. I would attack and, and take more risks going that way at that moment. But anyway, they never paid attention. They didn't do that. But it's sometimes just a habit. Like some fighters hit their head to because they used to being in a ring and sparring with a headgear. So they do this. Uh, it's up to the trainer to to really to break that habit, to be yeah. honest, to look at everything and notice everything and be on top of everything. So when he does this, you tell him, hey, don't do that because when you're doing this, somebody can throw a punch and catch you. Your hand is out of place. It's not where it's supposed to be. While well, you're hitting your head because you think there's a headgear that's slipping over there. So... He, uh, maybe it's just a habit that he shakes his hand, he don't even know it. Or maybe he even did it on purpose, where he shook his hand just to make Woodley cognizant of the right hand, to think, okay, the right hand, you better be worried about it. Then he stepped out, then he came in, and what he did next was, it was, it was good, it was professional. He dipped a little bit. He looked down, he being Paul, he looked down, like he was going to throw to the body, and then he shot a nice, beautiful overhand right hand to the head. And Woodley never saw it. Why? Because he got fainted out of position. His eyes got taken to a place where the he thought the punch was coming, but it wasn't coming. It was coming from up top. He thought it was coming from below. And when you don't see a punch coming, that's when you that's when you have that's when you have a sensational knockout. You don't see it coming. You don't have time for your mind for your mind to prepare, you know, to button down the hatches, to, you know, to to get ready for the incoming missile, the incoming, you know, shot that's coming in. You don't have time to to prepare for that, to 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 ward it off, to to shield yourself, to to handle it. You just don't see it. It's like pulling a plug. It's like pulling a plug in a room and the lights go out. You just don't see it coming. You have no, no matter how tough you are, you have no time to see it, to prepare for it. And that was a perfect shot. And it was set up again, perfectly. Call him a YouTuber, whatever you want. But he did that one brilliantly. And again, just like Wilder getting up from the floor brought on all these millions of dollars when he got up, against I mean when Fury got up against Wilder off the floor put him in this position that's what's going to allow Paul says he wants to make 250 million dollars well that got him a step closer to making 250 million dollars in a ring by landing that punch and again it wasn't just a lucky punch it was a well set up thought out punch by Paul that allowed that punch to to land and to have the impact, the effect that it had. It was done in a professional way. Whether you like it or not, because of who did it, I don't give a damn. The truth is the truth. That was, And the truth is before that he looked sloppy and they both did. But that wasn't sloppy. That was set up in a brilliant way. That's, there's no other way to say it. And... um. Uh, I'll tell you, it was a rematch, of course. You know, the first fight, I thought that, uh, you know, I thought that Woodley had a moment where he landed a right hand, but uh, it was just a moment. And I thought Woodley probably won two rounds and and Paul won six in their first go around. Now, listen, we put everything out there. This was a last minute substitution. It was supposed to be Tommy Fury in the ring. Uh, he got COVID, I guess, and he pulled out. So Woodley was a last-minute replacement. He had about, 
what, three weeks? I think it was somewhere around three weeks, uh, somewhere in that area. But he claimed uh, he'd been in training. He, he, he claimed he'd been yeah, in training camp know, hoping to get but, some more fights. Yeah, so but but he probably wasn't in the intense training that you would be if you're fighting this kind of fight, probably, because he didn't have anything on the calendar. He didn't have a definitive. He was probably just staying in shape. I'm not making excuses for him, but it was, I'm just putting out there, you know, the facts. It, it was a quick replacement, so who knows if he had full time to get ready. But the bottom line, he looked like he was in shape. Uh, it didn't look like he really got tired or anything. It, it was, again, it wasn't a picturesque fight. Uh, it wasn't close to a picturesque fight. It wasn't a pretty fight to be watching. And it wasn't a fight that was going to keep the gravy train moving if it ended that way, if it went another two rounds that way. But to Paul's credit, again, he was calm enough in an uncalm environment to be able to, to see the opportunity, picture the opportunity, and then execute the opportunity for that. That 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 means he's advancing a little bit, whether you like it or not. He's a, does that mean that he's uh, ready for Canelo? No. Now, now, I say Canelo for a reason. There's crazies out there, and I get it. What what is a fan is short for fanatic. You have the right to be a maniac, to bully. <laughs> just don't hurt nobody. But you do, you do. You have the right as a fan fanatic to be crazy. Just don't be like Robert De Niro in that movie, The Fan. Don't get that. Don't get that far out there. But where, you know, it's your world, and you color your world the way you want to color it. It's your world. It's it's a little bit of fantasy world. It's fanatic world. And there are legions of Paul's fans now that probably believe that he punches hard enough to go in there and hit Canelo and knock Canelo out. You know, there's probably fans out there that think that, you know, it would be interesting to measure his punching punch, Paul's punching power with George Foreman's to see who punches harder. They, I mean, that's what the imagination, that's what part of being a fan does. It, it travels you to these far-off universes sometimes, Ken, where, where that's part of it. That's part of the fantasism of it. That's part of the, you know, that's part of the fun of it is that you can go to these places and you can say, yeah, this guy actually, my guy, because he's their guy now, my guy, you know, I'm telling you right now, he punches every bit as hard as Marvin Hagler. Really, really. If he, if, if there was a, if there was a tool to measure this, if there was a device to, measure, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. Okay, keep telling me. But at the end of the day, I uh, there are people that probably think he could get in a professional fight with a, you know. And I'm not knocking him. I just gave him all the praise that he deserves. But I'm not going to give him things that don't make sense. To, uh, I'm going to give him things that are true. They make sense. But there are people that think he could get in there probably with a, you know, with, with a good professional fighter and, and have a chance to win. But don't forget those first five rounds where he looked sloppy and when he looked very vulnerable and they looked very limited. That means that you wouldn't get to the next round. <laughs> One round like that, you don't get to the next round with with a top fighter that we're talking about. That's well, where the dream ends. You see, you see that he had uh, Nate Diaz was there supporting his teammate Chris Avila, and um, he Jorge called Ma out Nate Diaz and he called Masvidal and he called and them the were, B word. And they were uh, both, you know, they were both there. So there yeah, must be, there. there might be something to it. They both have one fight yeah. left on their UFC contract, and uh, they're probably viewing a huge payday. Well, you know what you're dealing. With? You know what you. It comes down to one word. Um, one word, one, one, I had to count the letters. I thought it was a four-letter word. It's five letters, okay? But one word, money. Yep. If the money's right, if the money's right, I don't know if it's 20 million, 30 million for Diaz or for Masvidal. I don't know what the money would have to be, probably in that neighborhood. But if the money's right, the fight's going to be made if he's serious about making it. And it'll be made. I mean, that's it. You don't need you don't need Notre Dame or like I used to say, uh, the amazing Creskin to tell you that one. It's 
it'll be made if the money's right. And I'll tell you another crazy thing, and I know you're going to go nuts when I say this, and I don't deserve you. <laughs> don't Can, tell I me don't, he's fighting no, Canelo. No, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't blame you. I don't blame anybody for going nuts when I say this, but there are people out there crazy enough to say that, you know, he punches good enough. And I, I was using that comparison just to get people's attention that it's in that neighborhood of craziness it might not be exactly that particular you know exact place but but it's in that neighborhood of craziness but i'll tell you something that if you made the if you made it 500 million dollars and i'm just using a number uh, that's a big one um i bet you there's people that would somehow figure out a way to say yeah Canelo and Paul 500 million dollars uh we're going to give Canelo or whatever uh and we're going to do the biggest pay-per-view uh we're going to break the records we're going to break Pacquiao and uh Mayweather we're going to break Conor McGregor and Mayweather we're going to break all the pay-per-views because there's enough maniacs out there uh that either they want to see a car wreck uh, they want to watch it live to see if the guy survives the car wreck, uh, or they believe that uh, miracles can happen, which miracles do happen sometimes, and they want to believe that it could happen, and their guy, their guy, their leader of the nerds, um, could beat, uh, you know, the what people think is the best fighter right now uh, on the planet or one of the best fighters right now in his prime on the planet and and make a Canelo fight. <laughs> I know people say, Teddy, you're going too far. But believe me, if they came up with that number or maybe another couple wins, uh, don't think that, you know, uh, everybody wants that extra money. You know, I, I know Canelo's got enough money for a couple lifetimes. But, uh, you know, if if you want to fill another, one more treasure chest, and this would be a big treasure chest, uh, and bury it somewhere uh, <laughs> for future generations, <laughs> and leave a map uh, to to your most loved ones, uh, this would be one that would fill that treasure chest if you can allow. But uh, I digress. I, <laughs> I I go into that. I go into that fanatic uh, place, uh, that crazy fanatic place where there's no ending to that. There's no limit. When you think you get to a wall, you look off to the side and there's there's another tunnel. It's <laughs> you like, think uh, you get to like a wall. The, the virtual reality headset that I, I bought my kids this thing, the Oculus headset. Oh my God, it's so it's so realistic. It makes me dizzy. But that's what I think of when you describe that. You think you've seen everything and then there's a button over here that says do not touch. You touch that and you're into a whole nother universe. But yeah, Teddy, to your point, I mean, I think that there there is a price tag to get someone like that. But I mean, I mean, can, I like Jake Paul. I hope he continues to do this because I find these these events typically to be entertaining. Hey, and like listen, you said, how, if he didn't get that knockout, it would have been a snoozer. I didn't like it at all. Um, listen, how? No, no, I, the train would have stopped, Ken. But listen, he he's earned the. He didn't land the lucky punch. He set it up. You know, unless yeah. you believe those conspiracy theory guys that it was set up with a little <laughs> wink, stupid. you know, a little wink, little wink of the of the of the shake of the of the right hand, you know, that little twist. But you just gotta, you could hate it or love it, but people are, are gonna be mystified by it. They're gonna be drawn by it. You can hate them or love them, but they're gonna they're being drawn in. They're being drawn in. You know, to see him get smashed or to, to see him lead the way of of their own personal, you know, voyage that they're attached to, to see how far this guy can go. Uh, that's what's happening right now, you know, and uh, it, it really is something to, to be able to see him and his brother. And I know a lot of people, they, they get a kick out of him. A lot of people hate him. It's okay, but they're pretty smart. And then to get up there because of that one punch, and listen, he earned the right to say it. To get up there, you know, people don't have to believe it. People don't have to hear it or listen to it. They can turn the TV off. But to get up there, you really, and, and say, anyone, anytime, any place, you know, I mean, like, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of ridiculousness to it, a lot of people will say, but they know what they're doing. 
You know, people say, oh, they're arrogant, they hate it. No, they're smart. Yeah, but but you got to give him credit. Yeah, he sc- scores that they know what to do right after. Anyone, anytime, any place, anywhere. You know, like anyone? Yeah, like <laughs> like that punch. <laughs> that punch proves that they could be the greatest of all time. And, and, and again, that punch gave them the liberty to do a lot of things, to make more money, right? And to make more fantastic statements. It gave him the right to do that. Well, one of the he, things in that, that he way, said. in that way, he earned the right. Don't have to mean that. It doesn't have to mean that it's it's true. But he earned the right to shout that out on that forum. In that place. He earned the right to do that because of that freaking punch. You know? And he did it. He, he yelled. And he's got people believing him. He got people drinking martinis or whatever they're drinking in that place. <laughs> they say, yeah. And anywhere, anytime we can come on, let's get them all. The one let's thing get he, them all. One thing he said that is probably true, or he has a claim to it, is that he's the most valuable boxer in terms of uh, bringing in pay per views right now. He's 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 delivering. I mean, there's only a handful of guys in boxing like Canelo that may be able to bring in more pay per view buys. You never really get the true numbers, and we never really will. But he keeps putting on these events and paying people. I'll to, give him one uh, more credit. Yeah, I want to give him one more. You're right, Ken. I want to give him one more credit. I, I say the things that I think are shallow or iffy or fantastic or played a little. I say them, but I also give him credit for the things he deserves credit. I also I often talk about behaving like a fighter, right, Ken? I talked yeah. about it today. Yep. I'll tell you, there was a moment he behaved like a fighter. You know when? When's that? When he got hit with the elbow. And he's, uh, he got oh, cut yeah, for the that, first Actually, time that's life. a very good give, point. He was bleeding bad. Give him credit for that, Ken, you know, because I've seen fighters, fighters, that the first time they got cut, they panicked, they fell apart. They didn't always behave the way you would, you know, hope that they would behave, quite yeah. frankly. Yep. He did. He did. He didn't panic. He didn't fall apart at all. I watched for it. That's what I do. I watched for it. He didn't. Not a, Not even a little bit. And he got hit a good elbow that, you know, <laughs> I, I mean, by a guy who made a living throwing elbows. So I'm not saying he did it on purpose, yeah, but yeah, you yeah. could accidentally on purpose kind of do that if you're a guy who's that expertise at it as Woodley. I'm not saying yeah. he did, but yeah. but what I am saying is it did land, it did cause a cut, and he did behave, he being Paul, he did behave the way that a fighter needs to behave when he got cut. Yeah, Definitely. Definitely. Well, Teddy, we covered a lot here. We gave everyone two and a half hours of action. There was a lot of fights to cover. We're coming up on Christmas. Want to wish everyone, obviously, a Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, whatever you're celebrating. Hope you guys all have an awesome holiday week. Um, I don't see too much on the calendar and ways of fights in the way of fights in the next two weeks, but Rob and I discussed maybe for the fans out there, we're going to try to get something up by next week for next week in place of um, discussing fighting. So we'll continue to talk amongst ourselves here at the fight and see what we can do in terms of next week to get you guys some content. I know it's a slow week and everyone's looking for um, content, especially being with the family. I know sometimes I need to get out of my house and just take a walk or go for a run, listen to something entertaining. So maybe we're going to try to get some uh, an interview or something entertaining. And um, with that being said, Teddy, you got anything before we uh, sign off for the uh, Christmas break here? The only thing I wanted to add to this last breakdown of this fight was sure. it was a funny thing. I was sending tweets out, and they were looking like I said already. They uh, Paul and Woodley w- weren't looking, you know, wasn't looking exactly like uh, you know Mayweather and uh, Pacquiao or whatever. Um, not quite or Pinel Whitaker or any of that stuff. <laughs> uh, but it was funny because I I had just said that if one of these fighters would throw a counter punch, and both tried a little bit, but uh, they didn't land. But I had just said if one of these fighters, either one of them, would just control themselves enough to catch the other guy coming in, you know, instead of just leading with punches and just throwing punches. But if one of them would just be calm enough and contained enough to just throw a counter punch, um they would catch they'd have a good chance of catching 
the other guy coming. In other words, exhibit a little bit of the sweet science. Uh, they would they would have an advantage if they could do that. And right after I said that, I forget when I tweeted it. Sure enough, Paul did show a little bit of the sweet science, as I said already, where he dipped low and he came high. And it did make the difference. So that's a reminder that it's not just about your physicality. And another thing that I didn't mention that I should have mentioned, I got reminded of, they're pretty smart, the Paul brothers. What an advantage he has size-wise. He's bigger than the guys he's oh, fighting. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, again, I'm not taking anything away from, because there's plenty of small guys that can beat big guys. So that's, that's not enough. He also goes in there and he shows heart. And like I said, he prepares himself to the best that he can. But he he is bigger, you know. I mean, when you are the guy that's writing the paychecks and signing the checks, you can have, well, you, you know, you can have to say in certain areas. And he has to say or the advantage in that area. Um, I'm not saying he always will, but, but he has so far. But he still gets it done to the point that he gets it done. And I give him credit for that. But it shows you. Again, no matter how athletic you are, you're not, how bigger you are, smaller, strong, whatever, prepared, that the advantage is being smart. I say that in UFC, I say that in boxing, that the guys, fighters get in there, if they're in the ring, they're both tough. But the one that becomes superior is the one who's smarter, who's more in control, a little calmer, and a little better technically. And that one advantage of technique really, really saved the day for Paul at the end of the day. That yeah. one technical move, it was a technical move. Stipping low, like he's gonna go low. Boom, coming high, catching him. Uh, the sweet science, that little nuance, that little nuance there. That was the difference in that fight at the end of the day. And that's why we're still talking about a man named Paul. Um, so, anyway, he's created his own dreamscape. He's created his own fantasy island. Do you remember that movie? Uh, you're too young. There was a movie uh, called Fantasy Island where they... they that was a TV show. The, <clears throat> of course, it was, it was a, TV a weekly show. TV show. The plane, the plane. Yeah. <laughs> the plane, boss, boss, the plane, the plane, the plane, <laughs> the plane, boss. And then they would fly in. These people that had the money, you know, yeah. to go to Fantasy Island would fly in for the weekend and their fantasy would be lived out. Um, this is what he's created. Paul has created. He should, after this is over with, he should be the guy he's, uh, not saying the plane boss, but the guy that's running Fantasy Island. He, yeah. he should have his own show because he's created a Fantasy Island for people to believe, yeah. to dream and believe and follow him onto his Fantasy Island. And, <laughs> I, and I ended with that and where I hope everyone's dreams come true. Um, if Just like Paul... If you have the guts to follow them, if you're willing to work hard enough to make them come true, you know what? Go dream and then go do the work. Go ahead. Go do it. And I want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas, uh, a Happy New Year. We'll probably see you before New Year's, but we won't see you, obviously, into after Christmas. Uh, good health and just great holidays to everybody. With that, guys thanks for being with us been an awesome year appreciate everything like i said we may be back with you before the end of the year but we're definitely not going to see you before christmas so have a good one hope everyone has a safe and happy holiday week <laughs> <laughs>